I'm happy to say uh, the Yellow Springs Brewery is a big sponsor of opening day for trails. And uh, we're also going to have Glenn Helen there. Um, Green Cats is going to show people how to put their bikes uh, on the racks in front of their buses. And uh, it's going to be a really great event. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, and this was a request by Karen Wintrow, um, if you haven't seen this, it's on Facebook, but there's a Main Street contest where Yellow Springs, if we win, could get $25,000 to support the Wheeling Gaunt project, which is uh, you know, the bronze sculpture that we want to have like downtown to really highlight you know, what's uh, so important about our community. So look online, um, there's lots of opportunities to vote, and you can vote every day for that. So. Brian Rails Trail, Trails is 11 to 2. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, so opening day on Saturday is 11 to 2. That's right. Um, and then uh, we talked about housing needs, community conversations. So any other announcements? All right. <coughs> Tonight, then, um, let's, Kevin yes. did have an announcement. He he wanted to oh, make okay. note of the fact that Thursday night at seven o'clock, the oh. Theater is hosting Black Panther, uh, especially for high school, middle school, grade school kids. Thank you very much, because I know I sent you something. But I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. so that is the announcement. Yes, uh, Thursday night, uh, Black Panther will be uh, shown again for. Um, Especially for the for the uh, students, this will be a school night, if you will, and then um, uh, 365 group will host a discussion after after the show. So send your kids, allow your kids to stay up a little later than normal. Nice. And uh, so that's uh, it's free for all. The uh, it's going to be a reduced cost. Um, it'll be no more than seven dollars. All right. Yeah. And I'm saying that because it's. It was set at seven, but then they were looking for an opportunity to lower. So um, no more than seven. All right. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. With that, uh, next thing uh, we've got is our consent agenda, and we have four items: uh, our minutes from the <coughs> March thirteenth work session, our last uh, council meeting, March nineteenth. And then there are two uh, resolutions related to our um, uh, health benefits. So uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. agenda. I move that we approve the consent agenda. I second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Reviewing the agenda. Uh, anything that we need to add? Um, I have something that needs to move. Um, the supplemental appropriations should actually not be with public hearings and legislation just for this evening. It should probably come after the pool repair update in case any money is um, allocated towards pool repairs. That's a good idea. So we could either do either move the move the uh, appropriations from the legislation or do the pool repairs right before we do the legislation. Either either way. Um, yeah, I guess my thought would be we would move the full repairs before the legislation. Anything else? Um, yes. I have several small things. There was one communication from last week, uh, last uh, council meeting, Callan Hoover, which I would like to put under old business to verify how citizens are supposed to report sidewalk and road issues. And then there are two communications, one uh, of mine, that I'd like to put in new business about the Bobcat resolution. And uh, the Emily Seidel um, requests I'd like to put on the other business. I, I mean, I can say what they are, but they, they involve some discussion. Yeah, well, Emily's is about clarification for, yes. yeah, and that does make sense under old business. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And one more thing. <coughs> Vicki Hennessy is not able to come tonight, so um, we either can put the report she was going to give about the 
Mass Farm Conservation Management the next meeting or Patty or and I can do whatever. I would like to keep it in, honestly. So okay, unless I you do. I, I'm happy doing it and you need to back me up. Judith? Um, I'm going to add under new business um, a discussion regarding the hiring process on the finance director and under, I think it would be under new business. Yeah. And then um, a little short thing on <coughs> the energy board uh, uh, has been talking about an educational event to, regarding reducing utility bills, you know, talking about conservation, and there's just a little piece that you must ask me a couple of commissions involvement, so I thought we might as well just put it as a little discussion on a little short item on your list. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, please. Yes, under um, executive session, mm -hmm. I'd also like to add an uh, element of the executive session for the purpose of discussion of hiring. Of hiring? Okay. Hiring a public employee? Mm -hmm. you want to do? Okay. Yeah, thank you. So with that, uh, Marianne, would you like to uh, review the petitions and commissions? Our communications. <coughs> Green County uh, is uh, having suicide prevention training, and uh, they, it's the Green County Health Department. The first one is Thursday, April 5th, and there are actually four of these trainings and for more information you can call the County Health Public Health Department. We got a communication from Laura Curlis with some suggestions on how the village can account for local event costs. Can I ask on that, where did we leave that? discussion because we discussed it at the last yeah. meeting uh, is that on the agenda yeah so we are supposed to talk about it on april 16th okay yes the mayor's court submitted uh, a report to us that uh, is a cell spreadsheet with uh, the spread out of what cases have been heard how much money has been received, et cetera, for January. And I just want to say I, I love the new report. I mean, and the police department has done this as well, just kind of like, you know, seeing month by month. Um, I think it's... I would like to reiterate that I think quarterly would be fine for me. <coughs> I don't know about the rest of the country. Actually, for the work of the JSTF, it would be great. Mm -hmm. for it's, it's probably just as easy for them to just put in the monthly stats. She's a hardship for them. It's actually a state requirement that they report monthly. They don't have to present it to council monthly, but she will have to produce a report okay. monthly. So. And then I would request that it show the previous months, and then once the system gets going, pre at least the previous year. Mm -hmm. So we can be, compare month to month and year to year. Yeah, a rolling 12 months is what we thought we might have. So January would drop off, January of this year would drop off when January of next year comes in. Just keep but I'd like to be able to see January of this year, January of last year. I mean, how will we know if things are changing year to year? That's what I'm to see. Okay, we will have Not to just what's happening one. this year or this month, but I mean, ideally, there'd be a few years, and that doesn't have to be, maybe that could just be annual or semi-annual. Maybe at the, the annual report. Okay, yeah, that would be I submitted a notice to council about a potential resolution that I could request to <coughs> council that came from a colleague in Athens, Ohio, about um, ODNR and the potential taking 
letting Bobcat, the Ohio Bobcat, be hunted and trapped. So I'm putting that kind of under new business. And we got a letter from Emily Seibel requesting clarification about uh, cat fee waivers that we, we put under old business. Mm -hmm. And that's for petitions and communication. All right. Thanks, Marianne. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to move into uh, public hearings and legislation. And uh, the first is uh, Ordinance 201806. Uh, if you can just read that in by title only. Sure. This is adding new section 1040.12 to Article 4, <coughs> Public Utilities, Establishing a Continuity of Service Clause for Village Utilities. Okay. I'll uh, entertain a motion to. Bring it forward. I make I move. Second. Okay. Uh, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this piece of legislation is basically adding a section in um, to Section 1040 of our codified ordinances, which are for public utilities generally. So this is to cover all of our utilities, and basically it's just a one sentence clause. Um, actually, it might be two sentences. Uh, yeah, no, it's actually one very long sentence <laughs> that basically says that the village will make um, all reasonable provisions to supply satisfactory and continuous utility services, but we cannot guarantee um, any, in our un we cannot guarantee uninterrupted service uh, due to any kind of uh, natural events or accidents or anything like that. So it's just a clause to put into our codified ordinances that just cover us from any kind of natural disaster or accident. Right. And you brought this forward because I noticed that we didn't have something like that and um, it was questioned it's been questioned a few different times um, during my tenure whenever we've had outages and such um, whether or not the village is responsible for certain things on the customers end of things and in doing some of that research I realized that we're, we didn't have a clause like that and every every other public utility does have a clause like that because there are just certain things that we just cannot prevent from happening Okay. So this is the second reading, and I'm going to open the public hearing on this ordinance. Okay. Yes, Dorothy? Dorothy Bouquet? Dorothy Bouquet. Do I need to give my address here? No, no you're good. Okay. Um, so this is for the users of utilities that would not be able to pay utilities no what is what would it be no this is basically just to say that sometimes you know we could have a, a terrible storm that knocks out power or we could have a water main break where you know water might not be able to be delivered to customers and in those accidental or natural disaster type situations it just covers the village to say that we're not liable for those types of things so that's the only thing that this is covering okay thank you um, one thing I just wanted, I, I noticed, um, I don't know, uh, we have a lot of pieces of legislation. Um, Dorothy's question um, brings the idea that came to my mind that we used to have little reports in front of each piece of legislation, even if they were only like two sentences explaining what, did, what is this really about. And for citizens, not only for citizens, but even for the council, um, you know, having that little summation I think would be very helpful. And so I just wanted to ask staff if we could have that going forward. So people know what the significance of the legislation is. Some of it's a little hard to decipher. Is, is that a possibility? Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments from citizens? Uh, questions or comments from council? Okay. Uh, Judy, if you'll uh, do the yes. roll call. Yeah. Krieger. Yes. Hempley. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so next we have uh, emergency reading of ordinance 201807, approving first uh, quarter supplemental appropriations, declaring an emergency. Uh, Judy, I guess again, if you're just reading it by title only. We're actually going to do the pool first, Brian. Oh, are we? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's move the uh, first reading board is 2809, uh, mending pool rates. Uh, well, no, I think she needs the presentation. The presentation on the pool before we do the supplemental appropriation. Okay. Okay. Let's do that. Okay, so 
<laughs> this is this is basically um, tying into supplemental appropriations because Superintendent uh, Johnny Burns has been uh, taking a look at the pool and various uh, repairs that are necessary in order to get the pool operational for this year. And this is acting strangely. Um, so Johnny Burns has been taking a look at the pool and any necessary repairs that are going to be, need, uh, be needed to be made before the pool actually opens this year. So um, this presentation um, was a result of a walkthrough and some photographs that were uh, taken to document the situation at the pool. And so Johnny's going to walk everybody through this as soon as I can get this to cooperate with me. Um, Exposed wiring, bad lights, the pool has, uh, I think it was 15 lights inside it, about five of them work. Uh, um, the price that we've got is to remove all the old incandescent light bulbs, replace them with new LED light bulbs, new gaskets. Uh, this is not something that I would recommend staff to do because of the dangerous parts of the gasket needs to be sealed and all needs to be properly done. The outside lights, they are HID, so they, if they go off for a split second, it takes 20 or 30 minutes to come on. Uh, a lot of bad exposed wiring on the inside of the buildings. They actually have extension cords coming from one side of the building to the other in two different buildings to get power to the side that don't have electric. Uh, the panels, they need to be replaced, but I, I think we can probably get a couple more years out of them. We just have to get all the safety problems taken care of. Um, this is actually a code violation. That panel is actually like 10 inches away from that refrigerator. I talked to uh, Brian and Patty and some others. I don't know. I need to get with this staff and see if we can go to a smaller refrigerator in there to be able to get through for clearance in front of that panel. If something happens to that panel, nobody's getting to it. Um, in the bathrooms, all around the whole facility, uh, there's like painting. Uh, there's actually some uh, moldy 
grown on the bottom in the showers, the wrong paint was used, so it, it can't properly be taken care of. That should all be epoxy paint. It should all be clean, power washed, bleached, uh, and then put the proper stuff on it, prime it twice, and then epoxy it twice. This is actually in the shower. That's an exposed fluorescent lamp in the shower. So my recommendations, of, and I call the company in, is to completely remove all the uh, light fixtures that don't belong there, replace them all with LED lights, and make it safe. The boxes are not even weatherproof inside of what location. That's a broken conduit that's in the dressing room. The wires are actually being pinched. And I think it's, I, I can't tell you what has caused it. I just know that it's broken and needs to be repaired. That's, uh, I think that's still the swimming pool. That's the pump house, the electrical, that's outdated. That actually needs to be outside the corrosive area because what's happening is, is the corrosion is just killing the panels and, and the aluminum bus parts and all that. Uh, some more exposed wiring that, I don't know how that, uh, that's Romex, that's house wiring. And, and the corrosive explosion proof situation is all supposed to be hard pipe. It's all supposed to be no chance of sparks or anything getting out of that. Uh, again, if you back up, that's an, actually a residential fan inside trying to exhaust the fumes out of that building, uh, along with a little fluorescent light in there. That building also has an extension cord coming from the back of it all the way up to the pumps in the front. Uh, so that needs to be fixed as well. Painting the inside, outside, um, and the kids pool. We painted the kids pool, I guess, two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, correct? And we did not paint the kiddie pool right next to it. Uh, we had actually shut it down last year because the paint is flaking so bad it's actually cutting the little kids' feet. So they shut it down at the end of the season. That has to have epoxy. It has to be completely stripped and epoxy painted before we can open that part of the door. Along with the kids' pool, that's the kiddie pool right there. Uh, we actually have a bad pump on that pool and it needs to be replaced as well. There's your mold in the, I think that's the women's shower room. Uh, they use some interior paint and in wet location, that's not a good thing. Uh, now the plumbing, all the plumbing's uh, been taken care of. It's actually all part. It, it gets taken out because of the uh, no heat in there for the winter time. So we actually remove and blow all the lines out. And the, the plumbing's in good shape from what I've seen. Uh, but the paint's not. Uh, and you can see that's all over the ceiling in the bathroom. Again, that's a jelly jar, what they call a jelly jar. It actually protects that lamp. It's on a uh, plastic box with exposed holes on it. So the water may not get up from there, but when it drips on the ceiling, it'll go right into that box. The floors, I can't tell you when the last time it was clean, but after, the, after we talked about getting it all done, having uh, company come in like they did downstairs, steam cleaning like the train station, completely of steam cleaning, trying to get all the floors in tip top shape. There is the kiddie pool pump that is bad. It's actually the pump that's sitting right there that needs to be replaced. The lifeguard stands, about new and 14, installed last year, uh, measured incorrectly, and now stand two inches off of the concrete. So when lifeguard actually stands on that they actually go down two inches before they start going up the ladder so there's a couple ways to fix it I think the best way is to remove the ladders take them to a welder have the brackets cut off moved up to the proper height so that the ladder actually sits on the concrete and there's no chance of the lifeguard falling but hopefully they don't have to jump down but uh, numerous concretes we have is there a slide in there that shows the uh, numerous concrete repairs? I'll, I'll go to this one first. This is actually the drain tile. I'm not a pool. I don't go to them. But when you get out of the pools, <laughs> this is where you, most people push up or step on. These are all loose. Uh, for the majority of them, actually, these two are actually sitting up uh, with Marianne Bryan. There's actually what, three more past that that was loose when I was in there. Um, what that is, is when you get out of the pool or the water splashes up, that is actually like a gutter that goes back to the 
the filter rooms. Inside that, if you could blow that up, is all the mortar, all the concrete that's tearing up our homes. And they actually clean that out of the filters. So what needs to happen is we need to get a mortar person in there, masonite, masonry to come in there and resell the stones, at least all the stones that we can find loose before we completely redo the outside room. Because what's going to happen is if you back up, somebody's going to jump in that pool, they're going to step on the edge, it's going to flop up. If they fall in the pool, it's pretty good. If they go backwards, there's a chance of injury of their head or someone that's concrete. And Johnny, uh, just to clarify, we found, what, five that were loose? Five right there next to those two. <coughs> uh -huh. uh, the one with caution tape is on the deep end, and it's been sitting there. Uh -huh. So I can't tell you how many is loose on that side. I think really to have it done correct, you have somebody come in and, and tap test them or tell us how many that they need to be repaired. Um, the purple paint is to identify that there's a trip hazard there, and we have them all over the pool area. If they're over like three eighths of an inch, they got to be identified for the health district. But there's a lot of purple paint out there on the ground. Is that just a matter of shaving those off? Or I think it? for right now, we could get by with grinding it, trying to get it spread out, but there's other concrete repairs that need to be done. Yeah. Um, and it could be as simple as grinding it, it could be cutting out a section and trying to smooth it out. Kind of yeah. So, now it's up to you. Do uh, you want me to go through that? Yeah, there's there's a document that was submitted in the packet uh, titled Pool Repairs and Maintenance, and it basically goes through in the same order that Johnny just presented this um, in terms of estimated costs. Johnny's tried to put this together in the last two weeks um, to try to get these estimates, so I just want counsel to keep in mind that these are, these are loose estimates. Um, once he has a firm direction, he will, of course, get more estimates for each of the jobs, but he was basing these off of what he could um, in such a short window of time. So just keep in mind that some of these are loose estimates, but there is an estimated cost that's associated which, with each of the um, items that were in the presentation. Correct. The, uh, the new roof on the pump house, uh, just to do the roof, raise it put a three-foot gable on one end and nothing on the other one, slope it away from the pool. Uh, with a metal roof was 17000 The additional block wall or block building with uh, double doors for the chlorine uh, room was another 10000 uh, Electric repairs for the entire facility is uh, 27900 That's all the LED, uh, the exhaust fans, any broken conduits. Um, painting inside out, all epoxy. All the right stuff. It was thirty-one thousand. Uh, diving board. Um, I'm ballparking this one, but there's two of them out there. I'm figuring fifteen hundred dollars. Pump replacements for the kiddie pool and the two other small pumps was fifteen hundred. And not fat, I said fifteen thousand on dive boards. Only fifteen hundred. Uh, stock parts for the pool. They have no parts whatsoever so we need to get them some hosing and some lines and some different filters and all that I'm basing a thousand dollars lifeguard repair stand I'm hoping that I can get them taken off by our staff take them to a custom repair shop and get them back for about a thousand dollars and then concrete repairs I said 12 to 18 but it could go higher than that I, I got to get it actually out there and look unknowns so uh, my best guess right now is about one hundred and two to one hundred and ten thousand dollars, and that's I guess on some of it it's it's pretty accurate on the quotes from the, the pump house, the electrical, and the paint. Those are hard quotes, and that is uh, to get it done prior to Memorial Day. So I thank you. Okay. I, this seems like bad news and good news. The bad news is that... Might not want to sit down yet. The <laughs> <laughs> bad news is that I, I can attest that there's a lot of repairs that are needed and we don't want to have a pool that, <laughs> that is in the state that it's in right now. And it's unfortunate that it's 
in that state. The good news is I really appreciate what you have done and the rest of the staff have done to identify the things that do need to be repaired and how to do it. I feel quite confident. And I appreciate the fact that you Go, my mind several times went to can't staff do that and I appreciate your delineating when you already thought about when staff could and should do it well, especially when you're talking about the lights and the pool I said that sounds easy enough and then as soon as I thought that you said no we're not going to have we're going to do it so because of the potential danger you know, we don't have to be liable for, for that so again I do echo uh, Mary's comments uh, I mean there, you know the, in the changing room there's water water and electricity do not work well together and then in the pump houses and the storage things there are toxic chemicals and electricity and water and leaking water um, and then you saw the concrete and things so you know it's really it's really a, a facility that needs to be in really good repair so, so I guess one thing I want to highlight is delineating you know what is about maintenance you know, like roofs and things like that, which we saw, versus what is about safety. And um, I am going to be, you know, very clear that I am committed to opening the pool this year. Um, I think it's important for our community. And uh, as you shared, Johnny, as soon as the community shuts down a pool, it never gets open again. And so, um, you know, I, I think one thing we need to uh, make sure we delineate is the difference between the things that are about safety and the things like, you know, again, like leaking roofs, which, you know, we need to fix because it's damaging our pumps and costing things in the long term. So I just want to put that out there. Sounds to me like it's all... Uh, everything that you've talked about sounds to me like it's all safety because yeah. you're talking about chemicals chemical areas could be wrong but well I think we're all committed to having the pool open beginning of the, of the year uh, but I'm one question I have is that currently we have a balance of $288,000 in the parks and rec fund this is the improvement fund so that's not okay and so we're talking about estimated cost of these repairs up to a hundred and twelve thousand dollars basically um and i'm wondering we just tell can you talk a minute about that fund and how we the money gets there and how it got there and did we put any in this year during uh how much we put in during the uh you know during our discussion about the budget and are there other issues that need to come out of that fund? Are there other expenses? I guess that's my question. Well, the Parks and Recreation Improvement Fund, it had, when I started, it was the only improvement fund that had any sort of a balance in it. And um, the village has continued to put money into it every year for the last couple of years. And I think 50000 was the amount that was put in in 2018 at the beginning of the year. And I believe that that was the same amount in 2017 as well. So we have been moving some money in there, and we, we have spent a little bit out of there for uh, various things. I think that the softball fields, when that renovation was done, that came out of the Parks and Rec Improvement Fund. Um, I think that there may have only been one other smaller project or so that might have come out there, come out of that money since I've been here. Is there anything in this year's budget coming out of it no. other than what we're talking no, about? No, we had not allocated anything to come out of that budget, which was why I wanted to talk about this before we did the supplemental appropriations because there's no money committed uh, or appropriated to be spent out of that fund. So if we are going to put anything towards the pool, it would need to be appropriated tonight in order to be able to, to get this moving. Well, it seems that, I mean, Looking at the pictures was really helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, the pictures worth you know oh, yeah. a billion words in this case. <laughs> and it's you know it's clear that this didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen over the past year. Right. And some of the decisions that were made were not the right decisions. Wrong type of paint. Mm -hmm. Wrong kind of wiring. So uh, 
uh, what I'm hearing is that there's an agreement that the pool is important to the community, <coughs> that there's budget set aside for this kind of parks and recreation improvement, and we have a responsibility to maintain safety for the community. And I feel like we're fortunate that there hasn't been any kind of injury or issue up to this point. It's pretty shocking that it's that it's come to this point. So I'm really glad to have it brought to our attention and it, I'm glad it sounds like we're going to move, move forward to do something about it. I have a question, Melissa. Mm -hmm. If we appropriate whatever amount we do, let's mm -hmm. say we appropriate more than is needed or less, what are the ramifications of either? Um, so I would probably suggest maybe appropriating a bit more than than what you might need because if you don't spend it, it's 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 still it it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere. It would just go back into that fund at the end of the year. If you don't appropriate enough, though, you would have to come back with another supplemental appropriation. And with this being such a short window in which to make these repairs. I would suggest probably appropriating more than what you need and maybe just give some direction as to where you might like to keep that or what might be the priorities or something like that so that you don't have to come back because you're going to be without a finance director very soon and having supplemental appropriations come back um, quickly I don't think is the best option. I, I would suggest $150,000. Can I, can I ask? Direct Kevin from it. I see where you was going with the staff thing, but let me just tell you, the staff would jump through hoops. But we have so many projects right now mm -hmm. that I feel this one needs to be 100% contracted out, and then I, I can watch the project myself. But we have unidirectional flushing coming. We have power poles that are falling. We have grasses growing, and they be growing more tomorrow. So I don't think this is where staff <coughs> needs to be. Right. I think this needs to be done. I've done electric for 30 years, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'd rather not have that responsibility mm -hmm. for pool lights and stuff like that. I, I, I know that companies have done it, but I'm just not that man. Right. <laughs> no, I, and I, I'm with you 100%. I guess my only question would be where you have done, you've got some a concrete, I don't want to say concrete because you've done some hard estimates. Um, but then where you've had to guess, you feel like you've already guessed on the high side? On the ones that I've had to guess, yes, I think I'm on the high side. Okay. Um, I don't think I'm on the high side of the concrete. I've not been able to get solid numbers, but I think that there's more issues that we could, I need to have somebody come up there to look at it and give me hard numbers. Okay. And, and, and the problem is, is we're two months. Right. That's what's going to be the... The kicker that's going to be the, a lot of guys are already busy, so I've got to find that special person with a special price to be able to come in and do the job and do it correctly. Uh, we don't want to just hire somebody just to get it done because then we'll create ourselves more of a problem. Right, good, thank you. I was going to say the original levy that we passed how many years ago was it? A long time ago, 2005. <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the commitments that was made was a commitment to the pool. And commitment to the library building. There were certain ser services that we made commitment to uh, with that levy, and so I think that's how that improvement fund was first established. I believe you're right. So I mean, it could be that in the future uh, budget times, we're going to have to maybe look at a little. This is we're going to be spending a big chunk on it. Although, what is it? Twenty-eight. But I was going up. Mm -hmm. So we're in. Right. I'll go back to my suggestion. Just I'm suggesting 150 because I think that probably there will be some overruns on the concrete, and I assume that anything that wouldn't be spent could be kept in the pool for repair, maintenance. Clearly, they're hoping. That. Yes. I'll second it. Okay. I'm not really. I'm not sure we're making a motion at this point because we have to go back to the uh, oh that's right you know the yeah. appropriation yes but that being said I do want to underscore that you know part of what has been referenced here is you know a, a lack of attention to maintenance 
which is responsibility of our village manager and a responsibility of our uh, you know our staff so I mean I think that's a critical thing to remember moving forward so thank you Johnny okay Kevin did you have that no just Yes, thank you. Uh, all right, Ted. Yeah, we can take a comment. I want to remember, <coughs> but if you're going for $150,000 to a contractor, you have to solicit bids. And if you try to specify, a contractor can't legitimately specify what's required in all the different conditions because of the topic chemicals that are in there. Metals can't be used in a roof because chlorine and metals are completely corrosive. You have to use stainless steel fasteners. You should be using wood. You should have certain backups for the <coughs> concrete block to be able to receive the moisture coming in and going out. So it, it should be specified by a design professional and then solicited for bids. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, don't apologize. That's good to emphasize. So. Well, and, and it will likely be multiple different contracts to different contractors. I don't think that Johnny's idea. I don't have one. I got multiple contracts. Right. To bid what? You have multiple quotes on various repairs. Correct. Okay. So it depends on what his yeah. quotes are. There's also a layer, a layer of responsibility. Um, when you have liability. If a design professional specifies a certain type of roof based on those chemicals, I don't, a contractor is going to look at it and say, I'll put whatever roof you want. And I'm trying to say to the village that it's up to the village to make sure that there is a professional and liable party that specifies these things so that they don't fail. And you know, with all due respect to the contract, it's protecting them also. So, you know, I mean, there's a reason why you hire a design professional to specify these particular conditions, especially when they're all over the board. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ted. All right. So, with that, um, I guess we are ready to move into first quarter supplemental appropriations. So, uh, Judy, if you want to read that in title only. Yeah, this is the Ordinance 2018-07, the 2018 Supplemental Appropriations and Declaring an Emergency, Village of Village. Okay, uh, I entertain the motion. Move. Second. Okay. Um, Melissa? Okay, so this is one of the uh, last minute items that I wanted to get on the agenda before I left. Um, so what I, what I did with the supplemental appropriations is everybody probably remembers from previous presentations of supplemental appropriations is there is an actual ordinance and it's a two page ordinance in the traditional format. And then I also include a supplemental appropriation worksheet which I think is uh, very helpful in this regard which it, it talks about department and cost and project and things like that. What it, it gives just a, a lot more detail um, in support of the ordinance, which you know is the is kind of the bare minimum um, information that I have to uh, submit to the county. In this case, there's also a uh, another worksheet which uh, ties into the uh, Bryan Center costs. Um, so I'll just quickly go through this. What what I did was I basically sat down um, with Johnny. The majority of this stuff came from him because, um, as everybody's aware. Um, after the uh, departure of our streets and parks uh, superintendent, Johnny was asked to pick up in that regard. And so he uh, took a look at those budgets with a different uh, point of view and went through and based upon some of the things that have already been spent and some of the ideas that he has for the rest of the year, he added some money to some of those areas in which he's going to be overseeing, which uh, he wasn't able to be part of that original budget. So uh, just quickly, um, in the general fund, we have $14,950 worth of appropriations, um, a computer for the mayor, some heating uh, con controls for the AC unit at the library, and then uh, the $10,000 transfer out to support the YS Clifton connector as a result of that uh, resolution that was passed several meetings ago, and uh, the uh, fund that was just recently created as well. 
Then we have the special revenue funds. We have a, a new trailer for streets. We have uh, $12,000 worth of Bryan Center costs that were not budgeted for, which that's what the supplemental sheet uh, is outlining. These are all things that have already uh, been expensed out. These were all things that happened as a result of moving some offices around to make room for new staff and such. Um, so that, that other second worksheet ties in with that. There's $11,000 requested by the police department to come out of the state law enforcement trust fund for the purchase of body cameras for all police officers. And then we've got the capital projects fund. Uh, let me back up. That was $30,000 total for the special revenue funds. And then for the capital projects funds, we've got a uh, grant reimbursement uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers grant fund in the amount of $288,063. What that's gonna do is take all of the money that's in that grant fund now that that grant is closed out and it's gonna move it back to the general fund. So it will zero that out and all that money will go back to the general fund. Um, so one comment I would like to make is for council to think about what, if anything, they might wanna do with that extra chunk of money that's gonna be coming back into the general fund if there's anything that they might like to earmark that for uh, for the future or move to any of the uh, miscellaneous improvement funds or anything like that because that's a quite a large amount of money that's going to be coming into the general fund that was expected but wasn't necessarily budgeted for. Um, uh, then there's $17,000 worth of engineering for the YS Clifton connector. Um, I was basically just appropriating everything that was going to be available in that fund, so whether or not we need it at this point. So if I need to change that, Brian, just let me know and I can make that quick change. Well, so since you brought that up, so I know 7,000 came from the Community Foundation. Correct. And then we're appropriating 10. Yes. And then Clifton's going to send us a check for three. Yeah, I didn't know so about the three from Clifton <coughs> until today. Okay. Um, it may have been brought up before, but I wasn't thinking about it. So if we need to change that amount at all, we can do that at this point too. Okay. And then uh, finally, um, <laughs> that capital projects funds, uh, we would be adding money from the pool. So I think Marion was recommending 150,000. So whatever that figure is, this is where we would be putting that would be in the capital projects funds. Mm -hmm. And then we've got uh, enterprise funds. We've got uh, this. $15,000 for the additional cost of a bucket truck to offset a trade-in. What that was from was uh, Johnny had uh, budgeted spending $15,000 less on his bucket truck because he was going to uh, trade it in, and then he ended up selling it on gov deals for $30,000. or thirty-one. Yeah, so he ended up getting twice as much out of it. So we basically have to appropriate more money to be spent on the truck even though he got back much more. Um, it's just kind of a technicality there. Um, $48,000 out of electric for aid to construction for Cresco project and they've already sent us a check for that so that's basically uh, zero expense to the village but we still have to incur that cost. And then sewer collection we've got some Quarry Street sewer repair and uh, small jetter repairs for $71,000 total. So supplemental appropriations as they stand right now the total is $421,013 without any uh, pool capital improvement or uh, parks and recreation capital improvement allocation. I, guess I just want to affirm that some of the money, the two hundred and eighty-eight thousand, is is actually being transferred. It came in well on the seven and seven yes. thousand too. So it's not all for for expenses. It's moving them. Yeah, it's moving the money. Anytime we move it, we have to we have to basically expense that. So, yeah. It's so actually, almost seventy five percent of that money is just moving. Is money that's come in. Correct. Yes, because uh, the forty eight thousand dollars being um, being appropriated for electric fund, we've received that <coughs> money. The USAC grant fund, we've received that money. The Wise Clifton Connector, we've received that money. So. It's just giving us permission to spend money that we've received. So can you can you just say again what is the total amount of, of appropriation that's not a zero, just a transfer that zeroes out? Is that did you say it's the fourteen thousand nine fifty? It's more than that, isn't it? Um, let's see. It would be four twenty one minus two ninety five. Because two eighty eight plus seven. 
288 plus 7 plus 48 actually. Oh, plus 48. Yeah. Say that again, please. So what's the total? <laughs> let me. Let I have me, my calculator. Me, okay, it was two, 288, uh -huh. 063, and then 7,000, and then the last one was uh, 48,000. Two eighty-eight. I'm sorry, I just told them. But what about the streets and the crime center and the state and the body cameras? That's all. Expensive. That that's actual. That's real expense. So what was the last number? Um, I've I've got it right here, Lisa. Uh, three hundred forty-three thousand out of the four hundred twenty-one is actually money that we've received from other sources. So. Under. Yes. So the actual appropriation that isn't just zeroed out by something else? 78,000. 78,000. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. And then you would add the full repairs into that. Yeah, as it stands right now, we're only spending 78,000 of our own money. Mm -hmm. That's already budgeted. Correct. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Such a better number. <laughs> That's very rare that this happens like this, so I should mm -hmm. have thought about outlining that, so I apologize. Oh, thank you. So I think what we have to consider is, uh, you know, a, a motion to amend the supplemental appropriations for the pool costs. That's what we need to do. I'm going to make that motion to uh, move, should I say, from the general fund? Um, it would just be to appropriate from the Parks and Recreation oh, Capital yeah, Improvement. Okay. To appropriate from the Parks and Recreation Fund $150,000 to be earmarked for pool repairs. Second. Uh, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. So that new total of supplemental appropriations would be $571,013. And the new total amount appropriated, which, let's see. Just so that I've got this on the record, would be $11,114,570. Um, so before we leave this topic, the um, piece of projects not budgeted for, can we talk about that briefly? Um, I'd say that'd be Patty or Johnny that could speak to that. <coughs> These are just some of the items that came up with um, when Mayor Kanine was elected and we uh, made a determination that some of our services were better served by moving some of the offices around. Um, those offices had not been painted and updated in quite some time. The carpets were quite old. So um, the paint for the mayor's clerks, um, those uh, offices, plus the youth center, which obviously the youth center gets very heavy use and had not been updated for a long time. Um, there was... That's not in that one. No. Youth Center wasn't included in that. Oh, okay. It does say Youth Center. That was just paint. Okay. So, um, those were, you know, updates. Some of the things we did, we did when we moved the offices around. The tile for the back gym hallways, um, where the uh, handicapped entrances and the side entrances are from the parking lots. Um, those have new tile. The floor cleaning, which um, they did both upstairs and downstairs here, plus the train station, correct, John? Um, steam cleaned it, uh, waxed it, looks 100% better. It is so much nicer. Uh, drywall repair in the gym, the pottery shop door uh, definitely needed to be replaced. Um, and what we did there was, um, their request got a combination lock on the door. 
um, so that they can uh, consistently keep that safe over there. But there was some uh, frame damage around the frame and some water damage that just necessitated replacing that door. And then a new water heater for the pottery shop. Okay, so uh, the question I wanted to ask is, how are we making decisions about improvements to um, John Pottery, uh, John Bryan Community Pottery? Um, we are talking, our primary contact is Roger Reynolds, uh -huh. um, who we are working with as the liaison to, to the Pottery Shop Board, mm -hmm. uh, Community Pottery Board. And do they have any responsibility for those? They did, did, did they contribute to the door they were going to? Yeah. Um, they, as far as the maintenance and upkeep of the building, it is our responsibility. Um, if they want to do something like um, put in a new kiln in that, which they did, they raised money for that. But the building itself is still our responsibility, just like the library. Okay, but we we do have a library commission that you know talks about decisions about improvements, right? And we don't have that with the. Hot they they do have a board that meets mm -hmm. and discusses, but they don't but they, interact with us. That's correct. Okay, so I will say I'm a little bit concerned about making decisions <laughs> on those improvements without that not having any vetting. So, because I think the library does have that, you know, uh, that uh, I guess venue and. Um, so, in the short term, I would like to have the uh, John, Bryan, John Bryan Community Pottery present to this body, okay. um, but I don't know, that, that's an issue for me that is, you know, needs to be addressed. It's different from the library. Well, I had mentioned the last time, I think when the Arts uh, Commission uh, gave a presentation, we don't ever hear about the pot shop. A lot of people would be unaware that it's even, I know what it's called, the pot shop. It's a pottery. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> said it too. So. <laughs> uh, we don't, you know, people are kind of unaware of it and that it's actually a public resource in, you know, and they do, we had asked of them some years back when we kind of re-looked at that relationship. Um, you know, that they provide some uh, lower cost, uh, you know, that there be some public services is provided. Yeah, and, and, and I, they and do I think have that's the, happening, but we, but nobody's here. But I don't know what's going on as a member of council, and so I think that's part of what you're getting at. Right. Uh, it's just that, you know, it's kind of this uh, hidden resource, maybe a little bit, and it would be better if it was a little more visible, and we, I would love to hear, hear a report from them. Okay. And I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I, I mean, it's a fairly large number. I guess what I'm thinking, and maybe it's just that I, I don't quite understand, but um, the difference between uh, not budgeted for and having a, a budget for repairs mm -hmm. that's an appropriation, and 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 you know what what's the regular process? To just anticipate that we're. There's property repairs come up. You know, I'm not. I'm not sure how this becomes a surprise or it's something that wasn't budgeted for when it's not like something unanticipated. Like it rains really hard and the roof leaks. Oh, you didn't budget for that. But things like, you know, watching things erode and get old over time. I just don't quite understand why this is a not budgeted for rather than appropriation. Normally, the way the budget process works is we ask each superintendent or each department head to look at their responsibilities mm -hmm. and prioritize what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And then during the budget process, we appropriate funds for that. And so if everything that they think of at that time is normally included in the budget appropriations. If there's something that comes up that happens after the budget is done, then it becomes a supplemental appropriation because that specific item wasn't um, wasn't uh, appropriated. So it's that's that's essentially it. If it's not something that the the superintendent or department head notices at that time mm -hmm. and brings forward, or if it's something that comes up later, that's how it happens. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
I would like to add that the Bryan Center fell under facilities, which was under the previous superintendent. So again, this is just a difference in approach in terms of what types of repairs have been needed to be made in this year that we're just not getting attention previously. I, I appreciate that clarification. I think what we're seeing is that things fell between the cracks, mm -hmm. that uh, kind of a lot of things that needed that well, are now. Well, I think in particular the pool. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, I think this should not have fallen through the cracks for sure. So. I was going to say, but I think with the pottery shop, it is partly because it's kind of functioning very independently. I'm wondering right. if that's part of the reason. I know staff kind of keeps has a little more of a relationship, but that might be part of the reason. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think the pottery shop is is different, but you know, I, I think what this highlights is we can't just we have to have a process for making these repairs. So. I appreciate, you know, I heard about the new door and how it facilitates, you know, their activities. That's great. Obviously, you can't function without a heater. But that being said, there needs to be a process for and, that. And we, we as a staff have talked about becoming more proactive and making sure that things get on the regular maintenance schedule. Okay. It's just unfortunately right now a matter of catching up. Okay. Any other comments? All right, so I think we are moving into uh, Ordinance 2018-08, approving first quarter transfers. Title only? Yes. Well, there we go, Ordinance 2018-08, approving first quarter transfers and declaring an emergency. All right, I'll take a motion. <coughs> I move. Second. Okay. Uh, Melissa? Um, so this is short and sweet. This just authorizes the transfer of the money um, that you just approved to be appropriated out of the general fund and out of the Army Corps of Engineers grant fund. So 10000 is moving from the grant fund, or the general fund, into the Yellow Springs Clifton Connector Trail Project Fund. And 288063 is moving into the general fund to clear off the Army Corps of Engineers grant fund. So that's just as simple as <coughs> All right. Um, so, uh, I'll, uh, I guess this is the first of two reads, no, mm -hmm. or, yeah, okay, so I will, uh, open the public hearing. Any comments from citizens? I don't think you guys voted on the last. Uh, I ordinance. I was, did we vote on what? The supplemental yeah. appropriation? An actual yeah. vote. There were motions. <laughs> Gosh darn it, Karen, it's a good thing you're here. In fact, <laughs> there was no vote. We're getting flustered up here. <laughs> Thank goodness for group participation. <laughs> okay. So you've got an open motion on the on the last ordinance 2018 Okay. Um, well let's do the roll call. All right. Hemflin? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Hash? Yes. Okay, so then on transfers, we're going to open the uh, public hearing. We had a motion for that. We did. We did. Yes. yes. I moved. <laughs> Thanks. I did. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments from council? All right, let's do the roll call on that as well. Indeed. Stokes? Yes. Hemphorn? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Hash? Yes. Okay. So now we have Ordinance 2809, amending pool rates. Um, we can read that in uh, in full, please. Oh, yes. Um. Okay. I'll leave that. This is repealing and replacing Section 1064.02, rates, admission, and season hours of Chapter 1064 Municipal Swimming Pool, Park 10 Streets, Utilities, and Public Services, the Cotabed Ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that Section 1. Existing Code Section 1064.02 rates admission and season hours is hereby repealed in its entirety. Section 2, the new Section 1064.02 rates admission and season hours is hereby enacted to read as follows. Single daily uh, admissions, persons under age of 4 free, persons 14 to 18 years, $3.50, persons 19 to 61 years, $5, persons 62 and over, $3.50. Section B, Village Resident Season Pass. <coughs> persons under the age of four free. Persons four to 18 years, $65. Uh, 
Person is 1961 years, $95. Person 62 and over, $65. Adult plus one minor, $110. Household of five or fewer, $125. Each additional member, $15. Miami Township and County Ohio resident season passes. Persons under the age of four free. Persons four, four to 18 years, $80. Persons 19 to 61 years, $122. Person 62 and over, $80. Adult plus one minor, $155. Household of five or fewer, $170. Each additional member, $20. Section D, non-resident, season passes. Persons under the age of four free. Persons four to 18 years, $95. Persons 19 to 61 years, $140. Persons 62 and over, $95. Adult plus one minor, $200. Household of five or fewer, $215. Each additional member, $20. Section E, pool rentals after 8 p.m., one hour, $170, two hours, $230, three hours, $290, four hours, $350. Section F, swimming lessons, Yellow Springs residents are free, non-residents, it is $15. Section G, pool hours, open swimming is 1 to 7 p.m. all days, lap swimming is 11 to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, and noon to 1 Saturday and Sunday, and again 7 to 8 p.m. on all days. Section 3, grandparents should be permitted to purchase an adult plus one minor season pass or household season passes and list grandchildren who are visiting them during the swimming pool season. All grandchildren shall be considered a separate member of the household and a pass shall not be transferable from one grandchild to another. Section 4, the village manager is authorized to enter into an agreement with the Yellow Springs Sea Dog Swim Team regarding the use of the pool by said swim team. Sea Dogs agree to pay for the services of any lifeguards required for home swim meets. Section 5, the village manager is authorized to implement the new rates at the beginning of each of the swimming pool seasons as authorized by this ordinance. Section 6, the village manager is authorized to implement the Swimming for All program pursuant to Ordinance 2011-17 to provide access to the pool for low-income village residents as resources allow. <coughs> Section 7, village resident is one who either resides and or works in the village. Acceptable proof of such is either a pay stub or utility, utility bill. Acceptable proof of Miami Township residency is a mail is mail addressed to the purchaser, which shows residence within township boundaries. And I think we need to add that this uh, ordinance will go into effect at the earliest time permitted by law, which would be such as. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a motion. I move to accept the ordinance as written. Second. Okay. Um, Melissa, do you want to highlight? Uh, the major changes? Yeah, basically these are all the same rates that are in the current ordinance with the exception of the adult plus one minor. So the adult plus one minor uh, was added to the season passes for all three, for, so for village resident, Miami Township, and non-resident. And everything else is exactly the same. And then in section three, it addresses that the adult plus one minor season pass is also incorporated into the uh, grandparent grandchild uh, clause that's in the ordinance. So um, I did not change any of these rates. So it, I know that there, I was not at the meeting where this was originally kind of broached, um, not the ordinance, but it was brought up, I think, in my ABM report when I wasn't here. Um, so if I think that there was some sort of a discussion about possibly changing the um, non-resident rates. So if council chooses to make any changes to this at this point, then we could we could definitely make that happen. But all I did was add the adult plus one minor. Okay. And Patty, can you talk about the uh, uh, swim for all? Sure. The swim for all is um, essentially a half price. Um, pass for those who meet certain income requirements and the way to um, to see if you qualify for that and to get the pass under the swimming for all is to contact me and Willick in my office um, she handles that and she will tell you what you need to bring with you um, to show your, um, your proof of income and she'll get your pass issued I would like to add that the Yellow Springs Community Foundation is uh, the one that's the organization that supports that every year and we have already received the contribution for 2018 and I can't remember the exact amount but I think it was approximately five or six hundred dollars something like that mm -hmm. but they, they did contribute already for 2018. Great. If people are uh, uh, domestic partners um, same same sex they just show proof of co-address for household Any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, questions or comments from citizens? 
Okay, uh, let's do a, a roll call on this uh, package. I mean, Judy? Uh, Chris Stokes? <laughs> yes. Huntley? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next, we have several ordinances, and uh, Denise, if you want to just tell us what we're looking at before we read those in. Yes, I did use a report on this. Um, back in February, we had um, <coughs> Yellow Springs Brewery uh, made a presentation for a second site um, over they purchased the bowling alley. It's going to be called YSB Private Party. One of the things that they have in, in this location, um, they'll also be using food trucks that they do um, over here at um, No Works. Um, I think it was a bit of a surprise that, that they weren't allowed in business to. Um, wasn't sure why. I tried to do some research on that. Um, at one point it was in, and then it was um, <clears throat> taken out. There was a letter from the, the company that was hired, um, LSL Planning, and it was um, at some point Mobile Bed and Food Trucks was removed as not allowed use in business too. I did um, contact uh, Karen Wintrow to ask her if she might be able to recall why it was um, removed from that. And she said that she thought it may have had to do with not wanting business to compete with the central business district, but there's not the and there not being any appropriate locations at the time for food trucks. But the opportunity with the brewery is one that has the potential to change the fact of that district in a positive way. Um, so the Planning Commission agreed that this, you allow food trucks in business one, there's all kinds of restaurants, there's all kinds of competitive types of uh, businesses right there. Um, we see no reason why not allowing it in business two because it is also um, has food <coughs> and group pubs and those kinds of things are also allowed in business two. So Planning Commission did make a recommendation to approve that. And these three ordinances, if you agree, um, just add uh, food trucks to business to in three sections of our zoning code. Okay, thanks Denise. Um, okay, so with that, I mean, I think the, uh, the uh, intent is pretty clear. So um, Judy, if you want to read in by title <coughs> only, ordinance 201810. Can we all three oh. at the same time? Can we? No. Well, I guess you can for the first reading if you choose to do so, but each vote should be taken separately. So. All right. Yeah, I'm up for that um, because this is the first reading. So uh, if we can um, put all of those together. Um, sure. So if we want to read in the three, uh, title only, and then we will uh, consider those. Okay. So the first is 2018-10, repealing section 1250.02, schedule of uses of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1250.02, schedule of uses. The next ordinance is 2018-11, repealing section 1262.08, specific requirements of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new section 1262.08, specific requirements. And the final ordinance is 2018-12, Repealing Section 1258.01 District Uses of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1258.01 District Uses. All right, I welcome a motion. I move that we accept the three ordinance <coughs> duty just by. Second. Okay, and at this point, since it's the first reading, we will not uh, take a vote, and we will bring those back uh, at our next meeting. Okay, and that brings us to 2018-13, and uh, Judy, if you want to read that, also by title only. All right, this is enacting new section 1021.041, entitled Areas Designated Solely for Undergrounding of the Codified Ordinances of, of, of Yellow Springs and Declaring an Emergency. All right, I'll only take a motion. I move. Second. Okay. Sounds like Chris is going to introduce us. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, the uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Denise and Johnny and Jennifer Groom for my office. This has been a kind of an undertaking because uh, th this is what everybody's been referring to as the mini cell tower legislation. Uh, for people at home, or for the people <coughs> from, uh, who are here, 
uh, small cell towers um, are low powered and, and low powered antennas that attach to street lights and poles in the public right of way to help upgrade existing wireless network to support the concept of 5G data speeds, which in theory is supposed to be roughly 10 times faster than what we currently get. Uh, I'm not holding my breath on that, but um, anyway, that's the concept. How it functions, as I understand it, and I'm by no means an expert on any of the technology, but the concept is, is that um, we have the large cell towers that tend to serve all of us, but I think all of us experience the gaps in those coverages as we travel. So the idea is by putting in these mini cell towers in the more populated areas, that will free up bandwidth on the large cell towers for those people who live in rural areas would get better coverage. What that means practically is that in urban settings, that where the again high density of businesses or people, that's where the, they want to locate these mini cell towers. The impact on the village is that there's likely going to be a push to put these mini cell towers, for example, in the central business district because of the high density that's there. Um, now, what happened was that this legislation was passed in 2016. Um, once again, much like the income tax legislation, there were some onerous conditions in there that simply were not fair to municipalities. So, you can imagine, my broken record, litigation ensued. Um, while the village was not directly part of that litigation, um, other municipalities took up that fight uh, for us um, and others who weren't there. Um, as a result of the litigation, the case uh, was successful in the sense that the legislature agreed to revisit and rewrite the bill. Um, and so you've got the, 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 municipal, the municipal lobbyists on one side and then the, the cell tower lobbyists on another. The House has passed a bill. It is now before the Senate. They've held three meetings, uh, public hearings, and the expectation is, is that that bill will be passed sometime late May. The issue there is that the, under Ohio law, the law would become effective 90 days after it passes, much like our ordinances under ordinary circumstances take effect 30 days. Well, in the context of how the mini cell tower discussion has evolved, the problem with the original legislation was there were no aesthetic controls. The companies could come in, demand where the location of where they wanted to put these mini towers, uh, they could disrupt historical districts where communities had spent money trying to maintain beautification projects. There were no aesthetic standards. And, in theory, if there were development that was mandated by a municipality to be underground, the companies could insist that above-ground utilities be put in. So, as a result of this, uh, Denise and, and Jennifer Gruy uh, went to a, uh, I'll call it a, a seminar, on uh, put a, uh, hosted by the Miami Valley Regional Cable Council, and we've been monitoring, our firm has been monitoring it at the state level as well, working with Ice Miller, who's been handling the, the negotiations with uh, the Ohio legislature. The long and the short of it is, after all of this, the legislation today is only designed to preserve the village's right to, do, to control to the extent that we can what goes underground, which is simply a, 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 a broader incorporation of already existing language that we have in our code, that all new development be uh, underground. Um, we also, uh, I think one of the concepts that many communities have as it pertains to the aesthetic piece, if there's an alley that exists, there would be a preference that these mini cell towers go in an alley because it's less obstructive that way. So, um, as far as this legislation is concerned, this is an anticipatory piece because if a community wants to protect the under, you know, preserve this concept of underground utilities and be able to preserve uh, aspects of where these mini cell towers might go, we have to have this legislation on the books 90 days before the passage of the mini cell tower legislation, which has not yet been passed, the timing of which is uncertain. But we think that we're on the front edge of this. Um, and then ultimately what will happen is we expect the law will take effect sometime in late June, July, maybe early August. You will be seeing me come back uh, before council with a, uh, an entire codified section, much like the income tax, that will be inserted into our codified ordinances that then reflects what the state of the law is in Ohio once it's passed. So I'll stop there. I know that's a 
a lot of information to process. Uh, hopefully I said it succinctly, succinctly enough so that you can follow it <laughs> if there's any questions. Uh, so one question I have, uh, I saw the map, I mean, I mean, what's the limit on what we can, you know, designate on the map that has to be underground? So, I mean, I think I understand the logic of what we've done, but what are the limits to what we can do? I can answer that, sir. Go ahead. <coughs> what, what we were told um, is that if they have, say, say they want to put something on a pole um, in the downtown central business district, um, we, can, we can't we can totally deny it. We can say no to that, but we have to provide an alternative site within, I think, like a 100 feet range. So that's why when Johnny and I looked at this mapping, we thought, well, you know, that would be able to provide possibly going back in the alley for a pole there. But we have to we have to provide an alternative okay. within a certain range. And I don't know if that's been set yet, but at one point they were talking 100 feet. So another question, um, one of the last statements talks about like uh, uh, being able to charge, you know, reasonable fees. Can we do that across the board? <laughs> uh, that was one of these uh, sources of contention in the litigation. Yeah, we can, but the reality is uh, the, the fees that the village is going to be able to collect, frankly, across the state, uh, nominal. That it's not going to be a substantial source of revenue, and it was a sore point because um, effectively the legislation requires the cities to give away their utility poles that we invested all the money in. Now, if they want to put a new one in, it's my understanding that they would have they would have to pay for it. Um, but uh, John, is that your understanding too? It is my understanding, but if they go on that pole. We have to contact them to repair the light and stuff because the village would not be able to work on their own equipment on the pole. Mm -hmm. So we want to push them towards areas. And to go back to your question, the maps are identified right now of plats that have been started right. that are completely underground. Those are the only areas in town that are completely underground at this time. And, and that's what I know. So I guess I wondered, I mean, you know, how much leeway do we have to restrict yeah. other areas? I we, think if it's already an existing above ground pool, yeah, a pole, we cannot. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I, I think that there's, there's a basis for discussion. I mean, I, 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 and what we've tried to do is craft some protection through our home rule powers. Um, if it's challenged, that would be a, a battle we'll have to fight another day. What about areas such as um, the northwest corner of the village that are undeveloped presently that will be presumably developed? That was the expectation would be an underground? But they're not, we didn't, they're not, not highlighted. The village does not have right of ways on that yet. yet. <clears throat> the only thing that you see highlighted is where the village has right of ways. That's the only thing that we can actually protect right now <clears throat> is established right of ways with underground. Well, but, we, but we have it in the planning code. Right. That any new development must be underground. Oh. So, we're that. so, does that mean that we can yellow out last farm or no? Not yet. I mean, those things come up as they're developed. You can't. You, we can't do that. We now. we have we already have the requirement that when the last farm is developed, it be underground. Okay. The fact that it is going to be required to be underground should and I say should allow us to then make that yellow when it becomes yellow. Right. And do I understand from the what's in the packet that we've protected downtown to the avenue? Mm -hmm. okay. To the extent that we can because I think the utility poles there are in the alleys. Correct. Because we've got direct uh, let me originally the legislation did not prohibit the placement of mini cell towers on decorative lighting, for example, which we have. Mm -hmm. So now we've got some protection. One of the things that we will be putting in our legislation are, to the extent that we can, aesthetic standards and some ideas you know, some concepts of what we want to preserve the integrity of the architectural styles that may exist in the village. Okay. But it's still a process, and a working process, because we, we're not sure yet what's going to come out of the, the Senate, and it may end up having to go back to the House. It's just, again, this is just a first piece that's being recommended to all the communities in Ohio to protect the underground portion 
and the above ground portion for the anticipation of what's going to be the new wall. All right, any other questions or comments? And so, just to clarify, I am presuming this is an emergency read because we want to do this as quickly as possible. Yes, because of the unknown timeline when the bill will become law. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, Judy, let's go ahead and uh, do a roll call vote on this, even though it's going to come back again. Yes, McQueen. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Hempley. Yes. Couch. Yes. Okay, uh, so that brings us to 2018 no, 2018-08 resolution, supporting climate action priorities and actions curtailing climate change. And uh, Judy, if you could read that in full. Yes, <clears throat> this is supporting climate action priorities and actions curtailing climate change and encouraging carbon footprint reduction. Whereas the climate of the earth has been changing dramatically in recent years, and whereas this change in climate has been directly linked to the activities of humans, and whereas in the absence of deliberate action taken by humans to change these practices affecting the climate, the natural environment of the earth will continue to deteriorate to the point that the earth will become less habitable, if not uninhabitable, and whereas the deliberate actions of one individual added to the actions of others can produce dramatic positive changes towards restoring the natural climate of the earth, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs and its residents and businesses have begun to implement such deliberate actions in many forms, now therefore be resolved that the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs does hereby, Section 1, endorse the climate action priorities presented by the Yellow Springs Environmental Commission, attached here to this Exhibit A, and directs the village manager to take all actions reasonable to ensure implementation of the practices noted therein to reduce the carbon footprint of the village of Yellow Springs, Section 2, encourage all citizens and businesses to take such actions as reasonable to reduce their personal carbon footprint. Okay. Um, so I'll entertain the motion. I move. All right. Second. And is this Dewart? Yes. Yeah, Dewart Headley uh, has been the instigator, primary <laughs> instigator of this <laughs> document. My suggestion was that at this meeting we just do a first reading so if there's anything that people don't understand or want to spend more time on it should be like next year. What resolution do you have on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is only one reading. Because it's a resolution. Save the reading from the back. So. Mm -hmm. See, there you go. So, Dewart, <laughs> did you, what would you like to say about so uh, I'd like to say thank you, first of all. Um, we as a village have taken a, a few approaches at climate action planning. We took up the classic approach where you quantify all your emissions and try to identify um, the best ways to reduce it. We ran into some real challenges there, scaled that, that uh, approach back and asked uh, local uh, experts to commit some of their time and energy into uh, developing a, a somewhat scaled back plan. Um, and I would say that people in Yellow Springs are uh, passionate about climate change, but they're not passionate about climate action planning. Uh, so our current plan um, has looked at our what we've done today <clears throat> and identified where the biggest opportunities for us to make additional progress are. Um, and you know, real quick in that summary, uh, the work we've done around electricity has reduced uh, our emissions there, most uh, communities, most of their emissions come from uh, electricity. Our community, that's one of the, that's the, currently the smallest category of emissions. And as a result, as a result things like uh, transportation and the things that we buy and use on a daily basis are really the biggest areas we have for opportunities uh, to improve, uh, to reduce our emissions. So uh, this plan, uh, this set of priorities, uh, calls out the opportunities that we have and recommends that we, including the Environmental Commission, identify or, target, or take one of our top opportunities and begin working with the village and villagers on that opportunity. So related to that, Dewart, I had a question about um, when I looked at the national chart versus ours, um, what I'm trying to like get a clear picture of is when we 
you know, reduced our energy, you know, piece to 5%, did we just reallocate kind of? So, yeah, those are percentages, not absolute right. tonnage emissions. So if you can think of tonnage emissions, they've gone down overall, but effectively when you look at our remaining opportunity, it just reallocates and becomes electricity, becomes a smaller percentage, and things like transportation and industrial or, or uh, consumer goods become a lot larger because of that. So how do we know how we stack up in those other categories? Um, you know, I mean, once we like, you know, factor out like how well we've done energy wise, you know, how do we figure out like how we are really doing industry wise, for yeah, example? So, so these are estimates based upon uh, generally available numbers. Okay. Um, that other approach to know how, exactly how we're doing and do the, the full quantification is the first approach that we started to take and really ran into challenges really because of the size of our community getting to some of the numbers that you really need to know how you're doing with <coughs> actual transportation numbers or real numbers around um, how much uh, natural gas and things like that that we're actually burning or diesel fuel things like that it's very difficult to get to because of we're a, we're a small village, and those numbers are generally available at a larger scale. So, not to monopolize, but how did you decide what our priorities are? So I know you should yeah, listen so to the... When you look at those general numbers, then, if you look at transportation, transportation becomes overwhelmingly the, the biggest um, opportunity for us to address. And then if you dig down into transportation and look at both some regional numbers in the Ohio area and national numbers, personal transportation accounts for uh, two-thirds of emissions in the transportation sector, so everybody thinks it's all the big trucks and airplanes and things like that, and really it's all our personal vehicles and everywhere we drive on a daily basis. So looking at those uh, national and regional numbers um, and other sources for other areas is how we identify where those biggest opportunities would be. And really, we just identified the biggest priorities uh, based upon where our biggest opportunities to reduce our emissions further would be. Okay. And then industry, so 21% national, our like pie chart says 29%. What what is that? So again, that's really just due to if you, the, the biggest action we've taken is to reduce those electricity emissions and effectively like an accordion, if you imagine on that pie graph, everything else expands to fill that void. Okay. So it doesn't mean we're necessarily like worse in terms of our industrial... No, we really don't have any way to go. Great. Okay. Uh, one area that was identified which isn't an opportunity to reduce emissions further, but it really is to um, the importance of what we've done around the electricity and, and uh, the renewability of our electricity is something that we really have to, um, I would say, protect, and that's you know largely about affordability, as as we all know. Um, and then the other part of that is really to encourage utilization of electricity however we can, since it's very renewable. The more we use electricity and take away from uh, you know, burning uh, fossil fuels or petroleum, that's, it, it not only reduces our emissions, but gives us opportunities in um, how we source our electricity in the future, the more we use. So. Were the, um, so we got some numbers from the Department of Energy, which were not quite as good as we thought they were. <coughs> Uh, I know. I can give them to you, do it. We just got them a couple of weeks Energy ago. Energy board saw yeah. them. Uh, and yeah, it's not, but your percentages are not as. Well, it, it, they're still, it's very strong, but it's still, it's not what we thought they were. Well, I I still disagree with, okay. I'm still arguing with oh, okay. over that. So. Well, it would be comfortable to argue. Yeah, yeah. So you should, yeah, we should shut up. Well, I think it's notable that Ohio, I mean, one of the slides is the larger, largest emitter of greenhouse, greenhouse gases in the nation. I mean, like, yeah. Number six. Oh, 
we're number six. Okay, I saw largest, yeah. and then that sixth was on the next uh, yeah. slide. Yeah. I wasn't sure what that meant. Yeah. All right, so we're six. Okay. Yeah, I feel better. <laughs> yeah. this is still terrible. Um, all right. Well, that's. I mean, I, I. I think that's really relevant to the you know model that we want to create. So, um, well, I think this is excellent. I understand like the challenges we have with getting you know, you know, specific data for Yellow Springs, and uh, and I think the move that you guys have like chosen. To sort of like benchmark and move forward makes a lot of sense. So I appreciate that. I was going to say, in terms of affordability, mm -hmm. the Energy Board um, is talking about, and it, it would not happen until the fall, and I'm going to bring it up a little later because we want the, uh, we would like the uh, Environmental Commission and maybe the HSC to be involved in, clearly, you guys. Um, uh, in terms of an education, what um, Alan Brunsman is on our on our energy board, and he's Becky Brunsman's husband, and she's you know one of the teachers, you know that's done uh, such a great job at schools. I mean, she's a retired teacher, and we started talking about how the education should happen through the schools and through children, that they could become the monitors in the homes of their usage. Um, so we start talking about trying to do a pro an education program in the fall, and um, and so uh, just to say that you know, and we wanted to build it as around the issue of you know the cost of utilities and affordability, as well as you know environmental. Um, so we thought there could be a lot of interest. So our next meeting, actually, we're going to be talking about this further. And it's possible that Becky Burns can talk to her. I haven't talked to Becky, but Johnny and I talked after the last yes. meeting because he represented yes. me at that meeting because I had another meeting. Right. And um, um, I actually have sent an email to both Mario and Matt asking about getting together and talk about a PDL. Um, well, and Becky offered to be an intermediary, and she's got some extra time. And yeah. uh, Alan sent out again some ideas yeah. that she had. So. We should keep her in the mix because she's if she's willing to give a little time to it, it's very helpful. I think that's a great program. It's counterintuitive. Most people think turn your lights off. The reality is that really doesn't matter that much compared to the other things you do. So it's often counterintuitive, just as basic things you can do in your house. I, I would just like to footnote. Um, I think that while we don't have a plan and have priorities, underneath that organically many, many people in this village are doing various things to lower their carbon footprint from putting up solar panels to turning down their heat to walking to biking to uh, having better insulation in the houses. So, so we don't have this big thing on paper that would have taken a lot of money and or a lot of time that just does not going to come together, but we're really doing it. I think that's the nature of Yellow Springs. People are passionate about climate change and they're taking action. They're not passionate about planning. I described to people, you know, when they ask me, you know, tell me about Yellow Springs, and I said, you know, uh, pretty much that, but, you know, if you try to get everybody behind doing exactly the same thing, it's never going to happen because it's just our nature. We're a lot of independent thinkers. Uh, we think and share a lot of the same values, but we all like to uh, solve problems our own ways. So. Right. But I, I mean, I want to also say that you know by passing this resolution, I think it drives policy that yeah. incentivizes how we you know basically implement energy savings. Um, you know, we, when we talk about utility issues and that sort of thing, I mean, that's what we want to do. And, uh, and actually, Karen Wintrow talked about that, you know, in this spot quite often. And so I want to really prioritize that in while I'm really behind the cap. So, okay. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, well, I think all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.
Okay. Um, so next we have resolution 2018-09. Uh, Judy, if you could read that in, in full as well. Indeed, this is creating a permanent glass farm conservation area management committee. <clears throat> whereas the village of Yellow Springs previously created a detention pond on the property known as the glass farm, and whereas a colony of beaver arrived on the glass farm, making their home and creating a natural <coughs> serene location for all to enjoy, and whereas the village partnered with the Tecumseh Land Trust to obtain a grant to restore the area to its true natural habitat, removing invasive species, planting native species, and placing the area under a permanent conservation easement, and whereas many and varied species of plants and animals, including birds, made this habitat their home, <coughs> and whereas the continued existence of the glass farm wetland area is important to the citizens of the village of Yellow Springs and also conforms with the general values of the village regarding green space and conservation. And whereas the continued maintenance of the glass farm wetland is important to all concerned but requires a concerted effort over the years. And whereas many residents have volunteered time and funding to create and maintain this area, now therefore be it resolved that the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs does hereby. Section 1, create a glass farm conservation area management committee as recommended by the Environmental Commission to be enacted in collaboration with the village manager. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right. Marianne? Yeah. As council and most of the community may be aware, the Environmental Commission and uh, staff of the village work with the Council Land Trust on a Clean Up Ohio grant, a two year process of taking what beavers had started as a, a wetland on the glass farm and uh, renaturalizing it and adding a prairie. That work has been completed as of uh, last month and we now have a wetlands and we have a prairie. As part of that grant, we created what was called the Beaver Management Task Force and Vicki Hennessy was the head of that and it included some neighbors and uh, a couple people from the Environmental Commission, I was the council liaison, and then we worked with the Council Land Trust to uh, remove invasives, to plant native species, to develop flow devices in the uh, channel and at the, the wetlands, and to plant the prairie, and to make signage, which has been made, the signs need to be installed. Now that that uh, grant is completed and we have that really nice natural area with paths, we realize that there's a minimal maintenance that needs to be done. Uh, that maintenance is things like continuing to remove invasive species, mow the paths, uh, the prairie, possibly mowing once a year. There may be things that need to be done on the wetlands. Flow devices. Flow devices. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the beavers will come back, but that's up to them. I guess. At any rate, so we're proposing that that the people on the, be the beaver management team be uh, that that beaver management team be created into a permanent. <coughs> What are we calling it? The Glass Farm Conservation Area. Management Committee. <laughs> Management Committee, okay, we'll call it that. And um, that it, it has special tasks and they've been enumerated in the um, document that Council has. In and that uh, there be a staff person, uh, either the village manager or uh, her designee, to work with on this committee. So that's what is being in front of us. Now, Vicki Hennessy is going to be presenting this uh, as chair of the Fever Task Force. But she just came back from Cuba to a house that had some issues going on and a very sick animal, and she just wasn't able to get it. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that that's a pretty good recap. Um, I mean, we just uh, there will be ongoing maintenance in the in the area, and one of the things that um, that village council committed to when we when we applied for the grant was to create this committee to help with that ongoing maintenance. So, uh, so I think this looks amazing. Um, 
But there was one thing that I thought was lacking, and it's come up a lot about this area, which is a lack of knowledge in the community about this amenity. So I would love to add to um, these tasks uh, something related to promotion or you know marketing or education of this area. I mean, education is there, you're right. But I think um, one of the things we don't do uh, as well as we should as a village is market the, the amazing things we have, you know. And I mean, this is an area like, you know, again, I know that Judith is out there all the time, you're out there all the time, I've been pulled out there. But I want to make sure that there's programming involved in this area. So. I don't think we should market it out there. <laughs> Past the village. Well, I don't mean past the village, so. okay. but, that, but that's a good because point. Because you don't want too many people out there, I think it will actually. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Me. <laughs> I'm not looking at you. I'm not looking at you. You're so, welcome to come, but I don't want to So I agree. I, 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 mean, I, do, I am focusing on you know, village oriented programs. You're just very. So. Well, I was actually going to say, though, that you know the, the word market. Marketing, I think, is a trigger word for some some people. Maybe it's a trigger word for you, uh, for others in the community. And you know, I think what I heard you say, you know, is not a commercial marketing plan, but instead that we don't always do as great of a job of pointing out the positive things and accentuating the positive um, within our own community and there's an opportunity to do that right. particularly because it is an investment in time and energy um, i think that when the, the staff is able to get the signage put up that's a good opportunity for getting some photographs having maybe a little article in the paper and as we start focusing on the glass line, <coughs> that will continue and the people will continue to learn about this area. I, uh, it, it's a preserve. I mean, it's a natural preserve. It's not a park. So, uh, I mean, it could be overused. Yeah, I understand that. Um, but, you know, at the same time. <laughs> it's, it's uh -oh. same you're but talking about marketing. I, so. well, I, I wanted to use that word intentionally because I think we don't promote these amenities as, as well as we should. And we're investing time and energy in this and we need to let our community know. So I, I didn't use that purposely, but you know. We, we also should definitely focus on identifying the Facebook page or a magazine that Beaver subscribed to <laughs> and actively market to them. <laughs> I think that's really the population we want to attract. <laughs> Did you want to add something to this uh, list? Of um, so I, I would just say community programming, something along those lines. Um, and that contemplates our students, but but not just our students. I mean, I yeah, think that, like the everybody. Students are already, it says, encourage, right. encouraging and working with Yellow Spring schools as well as Antioch College to utilize this space for the study of wetland conservation, wildlife, and species diversity, aquatic parameters and other scientific investigations. Right, but it's not just study. I mean, I remember when Judith got me to walk out there, like, it was a great day. Like, I just, I loved seeing, you know, the, the flowers and everything. So, so you'd like to put something about um, uh, educating and informing the public of the values and benefits of the glass worm wetland conservation? Yeah, I think that's a good way to stay. <coughs> Um, all right. You said it, Patty. Yeah. You it. <laughs> Frank, can I say something? Yes, please go. Um, I want to try to give fair warning in discussions about developing the glass farm. Land development is massively disrupted. Massively disrupted. And when there are in most cities and other jurisdictions, there is always legislation written around how to protect the wetlands from that disruptive thing. And it talks about how stormwater is diverted. It 
talks about how utilities are underground. It talks about distances that development can be away from any of these wetlands in terms of layers of protection, uh, particularly when it comes to um, erosion control and things like that. Um, the second thing that I would say is that this is a constructed wetland, and that is an extremely important term when it comes to calculating stormwater management for any developments that go on anywhere in that watershed because it takes water all the way from the CBE through pipes and by land all the way through the Kenny Farm, the Glass Farm, into that, into that basin. If that basin cannot be altered because of this easement, we could get into some really big issues relative to being able to even do some development in certain areas. So, you know, everybody wants this thing to be a nice, quiet thing, but as soon as you put a house on that lot, it's going to disrupt it like crazy. And so I think the it should be stated in this document that it is a constructive wetland, and what that constructive wetland purpose is, is for stormwater management in this watershed. And then just determine, you know, what things can be done to modify that easement, that conserv conservation easement, because it's going to need to be, can be added to. Can you take that wetland up all the way into the king farm? Can you do other things to actually enhance that thing, but will cost development? It will cost development some very, very much control erosion control, all those things, stormwater management is very expensive. So just precautions. Ted, would you see that as um, something that should be part of this document or something that should be a separate document that governs the future development? I think it needs to be both. I think that the if there's a group of folks that are managing this, mm -hmm. they need to understand the intent of that as a constructive weapon and that there is potential for disruption because they're going to protect it. Their job is to protect them, and they will protect. I've seen people protect things here, and it's fantastic. But um, if we're looking at affordable ways of development, we're creating unaffordable ways to develop by putting a lot of these protections and then putting an oversight group that is going to protect. Them. So as long as they understand that, you know, and as long as the village understands that, you know, there could be a bulldozer within 10 feet of some of this stuff and it's going to disrupt it in some way when they do a road or they're going to change, alter the stormwater path. You know, somebody's got to hold on to that and understand what that's all about and not let this group be the determining factor. They're there to protect the wildlife. It can't be said that it can't be restored. Yeah. Right, because it can be. I almost wonder if we should hold this, put the uh, table this and, uh, and write that in because uh, I do want to, I do feel like that's a very important point. I think Ted makes a good point, but I think it might be a little more complicated than to put it in a resolution. I think we need to put some thought into it as far as a, a separate document that is in reference to the resolution or something like that. But I think it well, I guess you know, a little more time than. Yeah, that's why I, I, I guess I'm feeling we should maybe table it because I, I appreciate your point and we don't want to lose sight of that at all. And um, it, can, it will, as the, once the development is complete, it can be restored. But right now we don't want to get wet into the way it is right now because it may have to change. And, as, as one of the EC members, um, the, the conservation easement that was actually put on the property actually includes that language. I don't have it memorized, but I know at the time that's something we integrated. I know this because I'm in the watershed there, and I'm downstream and stream in the flood zone, so it matters to me personally. Um, but the conservation easement, as I recall, includes the ability to modify that uh, retention pond. We call it. To, a certain, to a certain extent. To, to, to a certain extent, yeah. But I think uh, with our commissions, we always look to our our piece of legislation that creates the commission as to what its purpose is. And so I do think the idea of having this idea that this is a constructed uh, wetland and so that people don't get confused about what their purpose is, because we run into issues sometimes where, like, like Ted says, people start to 
their job is to protect, and uh, so I think it should be built into this. Can, can I offer just a, a comment? One is that we did, um, talking about the resolution, had the, the bit about to be enacted in collaboration with the village manager, which I do think gives some leeway in that regard. And I'm wondering if you add um, to the second, whereas creating a constructed wetland instead of natural wetland, would that appease your concern? And let this stand. If it's not in front, it's not. And add retention basin because it is a retention basin. Um, I have no problem in uh, tabling mm -hmm. the motion and bringing it back when we're either either when we're clear about what we want to say or when we're further along. Uh, uh, last one. Yep. So I think we have a motion. And, and, oh, let me say one more. Perhaps, I think we do want the work of like mowing the paths and we want the work to continue. So if council is comfortable with the group as it's uh, now constituted, continuing to do that work. Because the, the fever management task force was supposed to last a year and that year is now up. I mean, I think I would like to make a motion that we table it and bring it back um, because there may be uh, things also that the group would do when these changes are happening to ameliorate negative impacts on the, on the wildlife there or something like that, you know. Okay. I will uh, second that motion. The table one? Okay. Yeah. You have to, there's no discussion. You right. Just, so okay. all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign? Okay. All right, we have one more piece of legislation, which is 2018, my me, um, 10. 10. 10. Um, and uh, Judy, if you could uh, read that in full, please. Here we go. This is adopting wildland protection plan update and encouraging source water protection education and activities. Whereas access to safe, clean drinking water is a necessity for all living beings, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs is <coughs> a water treatment plant that uses groundwater to produce safe drinking water for our residents and businesses, and whereas a wellhead protection plan was previously created at last updated in 2001, and whereas such plan was in need of a more recent update to ensure that existing possible contaminant sources were posing no immediate threat and that no possible new contaminant sources were present, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs Environmental Commission has completed such an update, which is here to attached and also recommends that educational information and activities regarding safe drinking water and source water protection be distributed generally to the village population. And whereas it is vital to the protection of our water source to be vigilant in monitoring, potential, monitoring potential sources of pollution, now therefore be it resolved that the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs hereby, Section 1, adopts the update to the 2001 Well Health Protection Management Plan entitled Source Water Protection Management Plan Update, attached here to is Exhibit A. Section 2 directs the village manager to take such actions as necessary to implement policies necessary to ensure compliance with the plan. Section 3 instructs the Yellow Springs Environmental Commission to pursue such distribution of information and educational activities as they deem appropriate and to educate the public in this regard. I just noticed that. Yeah, I got it. Yes. Uh, I'll take a motion to approve. Okay. Okay. Um, Marianne, Deanna? Yeah. So Deanna Newsom is the Environmental Commission member who has been working on this wellhead or source water protection plan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so a little bit of background. In 2001, the original plan was written. Um, the Village Commission was sent consultants to do a comprehensive plan. Um, it started out by delineating the area, the geographic area, from which the wells actually pulled the water because obviously that's the area that's most of interest when it comes to pollution. Um, that plan also identified all the different potential sources of pollutants within the one in five year time of travel zones. That's the, the geographic area um, that the water is pulled from. Um, they also came up with a very detailed set of recommendations um, for each of the sources that they identified, more being being the number one priority. Other potential sources of pollutants they identified were septic fields, um, agricultural areas, and potential fertilizers and agrochemicals used on those. Um, 
transport of oil, thing, other things on the road, you know, that's sort of some of the other things that they identified. Um, they also made a set of recommendations for education of village um, citizens, but also other neighboring um, municipalities, or I'm not sure if they're actually municipalities, but other areas that, um, like Cedarville or Clifton, that potentially manage some of the land that's in our in that area that pulls the wells pull the water from. Um, so that was you know 20 years ago. So things change over two decades. So a couple of years ago, the village council um, asked the environmental commission to just revisit that um, report, that plan, and do three things. Um, one was to determine whether that original delineated geographic area still is accurate and still sort of stands. The second was to see whether there were any new sources of pollution in that area. And the third was to sort of look at the education plan and see, you know, had it been implemented and if not, what should we do? Once we started doing that, we also decided that um, a fourth task that we should add to that would be to look specifically at Morris Beam, given that it was one of, you know, it was the number one potential pollutant risk in, in the source water area, and just look at the specific recommendations that had been made in 2001 regarding Morris Beam and see whether they've been implemented and if they're still relevant and, you know, are there anything, any new recommendations that should be made. Um, so we've done that over the past year and a half or so. Um, according to the Ohio EPA, the, the source water delineated area doesn't need to be updated urgently. Um, the, that calculation is made based on the, the sort of hydrogeology underlying Yellow Springs in the area, as well as the volume of water that's pulled from the wells, and those haven't changed enough to warrant necessarily uh, recalculating that. Um, for the sources of pollution, we didn't find anything um, new to report there, which is, which is good. Um, we, there's a number of methods that we use to look for those, look for any new potential sources of pollutants, ranging from what's called windshield surveys, basically driving around and looking, um, to looking at, or to asking the Ohio EPA to look at um, any permits that are, you know, new permits since 2001 that have been uh, requested in the area. Um, and the education plan, we sort of, I mean, it was 20 years old, and really the methods that they were suggesting didn't really apply anymore in the days, with the days of social media and things like that. So we decided that that probably needed to be revisited. Um, so we, we came up with a set of recommendations, and that, that's sort of what's being referenced, I think, in the resolution is, you know, these are the things that um, the resolution is asking the village to um, sort of make headway on. Those, re those recommendations were basically um, in future to update the plan more often than every 20 years. We suggest every five years sort of doing this exercise. We also recommend, um, even though the Ohio Weekly State said it wasn't urgent to re delineate the geographic area, um, we recommend doing it, you know, not, it's not an urgent thing, it has to be done immediately, but based on conversations with some geologists, they said, um, you know, methods have changed and probably they'll get a much more accurate depiction of, of which area is most important to, to worry about water pollution um, if we redid that. So we're recommending redoing that um, at some point fairly soon. Um, we're also recommending, because of the sporadic detection of um, volatile organic uh, carbon POCs, in the village monitor monitoring wells over the past 20 years. Um, in the report, there's sort of a bit of a history of that. We, we do recommend um, testing the operating wells and the monitoring wells more often, twice a year, for VOCs and, and then a whole bunch of different VOCs, so really choosing carefully which ones we monitor um, based on what is plausible, plausibly coming potentially from more speed. Not that we think there is anything, but if, if there was, what would it be? And let's make sure we're looking for those. Um, finally, there are two more things. One was asking more speed to um, monitor for sinkholes more frequently than they are now. Um, they were very generous with their time and showed me around and gave me a really nice tour of the facility. Um, I didn't really find out exactly how often they do currently test for, look for sinkholes, which is these are naturally, naturally developing sinkholes happening downstream from their property, which is a potential way that pollutants could be getting directly into the groundwater, which would be, you know, obviously very bad. 
Um, so we're asking them to conduct sinkhole surveys monthly and report those results to us. And of course, they don't have any obligation to do that, but um, we'd like to ask them to do that. And we also re recommend that Morris Bean add the village manager to their early notifications contacts in their emergency response plan because currently they don't. It goes straight to Green County if there's an emergency. Um, so there's lots more in the report. I hope you all get a chance to read it. But um, those are the specific recommendations that we made. And I would also like to point out the pamphlet that Deanna worked on. Um, it's a trifold pamphlet about our water system and um, our source water protection. And uh, I appreciate the work that you did in Indiana, um, as well as there's a little bit about pollinator regeneration as well. But um, this is something, it's an educational material that we could conceivably have printed and, um, and distributed. To put on the website mm -hmm. and on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Once, a, yeah, once we get the, it's not quite complete yet. We need to put the link in and uh, get everything else finished up in it, um, and then we can put it up and also have some kind of release for Great. Did, did you mention the um, the sewer connection between Morris? I mean, you mentioned. Did you say that? Um, I didn't actually mention it. I am like verbal. Um, I was going to say because you mentioned them as a, a as a you know key concern. Yeah. I just wondered if you would just note that also because I think it's yeah. Um, it, so the report. So we did two things with Morris Bean in the report. One was to look at all of the old recommendations from the 2001 um, plan and and cross check them with what's currently happening. And that's what I did when I visited them. You know, asked them, you know, are you doing this? Or are you doing that? And most of the recommendations were no longer relevant because, for example, the sanitary sewer, which had been in such bad shape back then, is now connected to the village wastewater treatment. So it's moved at this point. So there was really nothing, you know, no urgent um, 2001 recommendation that had to be kind of, yeah, it was outstanding. But obviously since 2001, there have been quite a few issues. Um, well, I don't know quite a few, but yeah, the, um, the sanitary waste which now, as I said, is, is resolved. The sinkholes being the other one. And um, there was another issue in the, I think the late two, so 2008-ish, it's in the report, this is all summarized there, um, with contamination that had to be, so the wastewater had to be um, pumped through separate, separate filter system um, before it could be disposed of. Yeah, I just want to draw attention to the fact of that, how that was resolved. <laughs> right. <laughs> and not that sort of hanging out there people didn't realize that. <coughs> okay. Very good report. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Good job. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from citizens? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. This is the time in the agenda for citizens' concerns. Anything that's not uh, listed as an agenda item, um, and we will entertain any comments at this point. Okay. If not, we have the Planning Commission annual report. Denise, you're doing that? Yes, I All right. So in your packet um, should be the 2017 annual report. This is for the Planning Commission and the Board of Zoning Appeals and the Planning and Zoning Department. Um, I'll just try to give a little highlights. Uh, planning, Com planning Commission uh, was very busy in 2017. They met 10 times, held eight public hearings, conditional use hearings, three with the Level B Site Plan Review, um, uh, that was Cresco Labs, the new fire station, and the Yale Springs private party. Um, they also approved a replat for the um, parcels for uh, the redesign of the parcels at the Villages Commerce Park along with the redesign of the um, streets uh, and utilities there. Um, they worked for over a year on adding to the zoning code pocket neighborhood developments and that just that provides another option for development of land uh, to help address the infill issue. And it, stream, it also streamlines the development effort. Um, the only way for uh, development for larger um, subdivisions would either be going through a major subdivision or a planned unit development. And <coughs> planned unit development requires rezoning a property. It's just very 
um, involved in the standards change depending on who the developer is, whereas this piece of legislation standardizes certain things so that it makes the process much smoother and actually it's that they came before the planning commission with everything that was required, um, they could actually be approved in one meeting. So <clears throat> they also, um, well the Board of Zoning Appeals, they held two meetings, which was half of what they did in 2016, which I think really is a reflection of this new zoning code. Um, there isn't as many, I mean there are still gray areas, we're constantly finding little text amendments here or there, but definitely not like what it was before. Uh, back before 2012. Um, the Planning and Zoning Office, was, it was really a record year. We had 106 permits, and, and looking back over the years, we've never even hit 100 before. Mm -hmm. So um, we had we issued 13 single-family dwellings uh, permits, three commercial buildings, two which were new construction, and one was for a remodel with an expansion. Uh, 13 accessory structures, two accessory dwelling units, three lot splits or replats, six demolitions of either vacant housing or accessory structures, and a number of signs, fences, and working the right-of-way permits. Um, we had 42 violations issued in 2017, most were for, for like vegetation overhanging in the right-of-way um, or tall grass, but there were several which were much more complicated than that. And uh, most of those were eventually resolved. We had one issue that's carried over um, involving rec recreational vehicles, uh, parking, and, um, and meeting with the police department. Uh, and getting their feedback on that. We are taking it to actually the planning commission uh, Monday, next Monday, to talk a little bit more about it because that is something that happens to be in the zoning code. It's difficult to regulate. Um, then the other thing that we have is um, over the past three years, um, surprisingly it's been three years that I've done this with uh, students from Wright State, but I supervised an intern through Wright State University's uh, internship program. And uh, last year, Cameron Wolfman, um, he did, went through tons and tons of uh, maps and catalog <coughs> cataloging them and uh, doing research for me this year. I have um, Michaela Grant who's with me tonight um, and they start in January and they end in April when that the spring semester ends. And Michaela's been really helpful. She's been doing research on a lot of text amendments and lots of other little things here and there and get her to do right now. She's scanning documents on our plotter. Um, so um, we also I have here with me tonight um, two the two people that represented both Planning Commission and BZA, uh, who were both the chairs of Planning Commission, Matt Reed and uh, Ted Denell, who was the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals Chair in 2017. Brian, let's get it from there. All right. Well, glad you guys uh, made it through. We uh, wanted to honor the two of you for your service. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, see? That's right. And he's fooled you, yes. Also, he tells us. All right, so, yes, it's Ed Matt, if you can uh, come up. <laughs> and these are heavy, too. That's what I said. <laughs> All right, so, Ted Donnell. Thank you. All right. Matthew Reed. Thanks for All right. Me. We appreciate your service. Thank you all. And uh, I think that service is going to continue from what I understand. So oh, yeah. You did such a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that up. Hey, thank you very much. Hey, can you give me the mic for a minute? I'm going to say something. <laughs> Use the Planning Commission. Um, the glass farm, there's a lot of competing interests. There's odd conditions. It's going to take a long time to develop a master plan. Use the Planning Commission to help you there. Don't. You don't need to do it all yourselves. Count on them to help you. So, and I would like to say something about that. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I've been on the board of zoning appeal for 15 years, and I can tell you the difference between the time that I started with hearing appeals on our zoning code to today. It's miraculous what we've done as a community to streamline, really work around building a code that is who we are. 
and you know when we only hear two cases a year and those cases actually go back to planning commission for things like text amendments we really really did a great job and i i'm really proud of that um but going to what matt said on planning commission um planning commission's role is a quasi-judicial form of commission for the purpose of understanding and doing all things related to planning it's not incumbent upon village council to do that planning process and a good example of that would be the the wetland you know wetland should have gone through a quarter of the planning commission review so that we could then look at everything from the infrastructure to future planning how it compares to uh, the comprehensive plan where are the watersheds where are the migration pattern all those things are important to the planning commission in looking at anything that comes for them to consider if council doesn't have the the time or the education frankly to do that process and that's why planning commission was developed through the state of ohio ohio revised code we are not planning commission is not a commission of council it's a commission of the state of ohio so that's why it's separate and that's why it needs to be relied upon more when it comes to anything that's considered thanks all right thank you Thank you, Ted, and Matt. And, you know, I, I want to say personally that, uh, you know, with everything that council is committed to doing this year and in the next couple years, that uh, we really appreciate having an engaged planning commission and uh, and having uh, somebody who's going to continue their expertise, I think, on BPA. Though. So uh, we appreciate it. So. All right. I'll take my check and go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, you got your check. <laughs> okay, we're moving into old business and uh, Marianne's housing initiative update. Yes. Um, so I'm going to talk about the conversations on housing coming up. That is what our housing uh, advisory board has been focusing on. We uh, had hoped at our last meeting to start talking about how <coughs> is it that we reach out to the developers and landowners. I think this is a very sensitive area, important area, and sensitive. That didn't happen because our attention is still focused on the housing uh, meetings happening this month and I anticipate that that's what we're going to focus on this month getting community information out to the community getting feedback from the community doesn't say that we aren't going to be continuing to work on some other gathering information but that that's the focus for April and I just want to say I see this as a five to ten year initiative developing housing policy plan and enacting um, and it's going to have various components so we need to move thoughtfully and expediently both and that's what I think I'm trying to do so does anyone on council have anything to say I just had a question um, as I'm learning more about how um, the housing advisory board was was formed mm -hmm. Um, you know, it seems to me like there's a sort of arc of work that's um, kind of ending once there's the community input sessions are developed. And, and I think you make a really important point that, you know, people in the community are really going to be interested in hearing as much as possible about what the next steps are. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there's been discussion on council about how long will this stay a village manager advisory board versus becoming some other kind of a commission or um, you know what's the what's kind of the longer term plan well my that the reason why it's a, a commission up for the village manager is because we have people with particular expertise and it can be nimble mm -hmm. and reach out and do things it needs to do 
report back to council, council can give direction, and we can report and involve the community. Mm -hmm. In a way that establishing a permanent commission or even a semi-permanent task force has more difficulty mm -hmm. in doing. This year is the year to develop the plans. Last year was to get the information about housing, the housing needs assessment. We're f finishing that to get the word out to the community, and we're starting to gather information about what kind of strategies can we have to develop the housing that we need. Mm -hmm. So we need to first agree upon what is, what's our vision, what kind of housing do we think we need, and I think we don't want to do that until we finish these housing. Mm -hmm. And then look at creating goals, specific goals of the number of housing and the types of housing, and then the strategies to meet those goals. And I see the advisory board being the primary mover in that. Now, how, plan, how planning com commission gets involved is a question, and I want to address that, at, at least start to address that at the next planning commission meeting, because I understand that I'm not clear about that. Mm -hmm. But um, for the foreseeable future, at least through the end of this year, I see the Housing Advisory Board being the primary mover until we come up with, here's our plan. And then once we have the plan that has the strategies, then I think we would decide, do we need to create other groups or, or where we go? Thank you. I, I feel so strongly that council needs to be in the center of the establishing what are our goals. Now, I'm not clear when that discussion is going to start, but the idea that we would hand something on, I mean, I, the idea that planning could help us, that seems very obvious that, that's, that they are a resource, but they're not the elected representatives who were elected to represent citizens and have the debate, the discussions with citizens about exactly, you know, we have this housing need assessment that is, is defining in pretty specific ways the needs in the community. And I'm extremely unclear and would like council to think about together you know, at what point, okay, we're going to have these public forums, we're going to hear, you know, we're going to let the, you know, try to make sure the public is well informed about that, about what the housing needs assessment says, um, but the actual establishing of the goals, um, to me, is at the table of council, uh, in, in discussion with the community, that's where the community most um, uh, is engaged in these kind of discussions, and I'm thinking that needs to happen sooner rather than later, um, and, but I'm not sure exactly well, when. That, I would like the council as a whole to have that discussion relatively soon. The plan that we did when we had our meeting, the, I see a vision being like a one council meeting probably, one statement. Okay? Then we look at the specific goals, council, and I think the housing advisory board can look at the particular goals, yes, council does that. Planning, com planning commission does not. I don't see planning commission having a role in that. And then the strategies, the housing board is gathering strategies, comes to council, says these are the kind of strategies that we think we can have. Planning commission might have a role in that. I'm not sure. Yes, I don't, council is the driver here. The housing advisory board get as the gathering information come to council brings the information so by the end of this summer we my goal is that we have a plan and we have we probably won't have this all the strategies worked out at the end of this year but by the end of the summer we have a plan plan that says we are going to build 100 senior low-income housing rental units we are going. We are going to. We are. We are going to encourage the building of these units. We are going to encourage the building of these units. Clearly, the only thing we can control is property that we own. We can encourage. We can collaborate. We can can support the development on other properties, and that's why it's so critical to be working with developers and landowners. But the only thing we can control is the property that we have. 
and we can create goals. We will. So, Marianne, you're saying that um, the plan is sort of the ratios of the types of, of uh, building that, that might happen, that the, that the Housing Advisory Board could bring a series of options so we're not starting with a white piece of paper from which to discuss the, and the choose. The paper that I think we're starting with are, are the number of housing units that were listed in the housing mm -hmm. needs assessment. Now those units were, if we are going to continue going on the way we're going, mm -hmm. this is what we could build. Do we want to continue going on the way we're going? I don't, and I think most of the people in the community don't. So we would take those numbers and look at them and say, well, it says we only, it says if we go the way we're going, we do 50 units of workforce housing. Do we want only 50 units of workforce housing? No, we want more. Do we want to encourage the development of 120 or 200, whatever it is, upper income units? I'm not, we're not going to try and discourage, but I don't think our energy is going toward the, toward help for the development of high-end housing. That will happen. <coughs> what our energy needs to go toward is the kind of development that won't happen unless we put our energy forward. Well, I think certainly what we do not want to do is to make any decisions about anything in the vacuum. So I think these community meetings, community forums are an excellent idea um, to the degree that council does anything. I think, you know, certainly there are two roles that we perform. One is legislative, but I think our first one is representative. And the five of us only know what we know. Uh, I think it is important to find out what the people that we represent want. Um, and lots of things I think will come out of it. I don't think it will be just a linear path of, of, of one line of reasoning in terms of the questions that will be asked at the forums. I think there will be a lot of things uh, generated from there and I think um, it, we would be well served to do that and we have just a general idea. We don't need to put anything in stone now, but just have a general idea of what we think we want to do or how we want to organize information moving forward um, and hope that we learn something from those forums that they are not a waste of time, but that they're very valuable, uh, appreciated by the community, well attended, um, and that we learn from it. Um, and it's, it's almost where almost anything we say today doesn't matter on this side of the public forum. So I say we, we get that done, do as, as good a job or the best job possible to make those, uh, you know, well attended and well participated in and, and hopefully we'll find some pleasant surprises. Uh, yes, I think the, the foundation should be the housing needs assessment. I mean, money, good money was spent to do that, so that's our baseline of information. You know, but I think we absolutely need to hear from the people uh, and I think we regroup after that and then do some of this serious discussion about how to frame that information moving forward. Okay. Something else, Lisa? No. no. Okay. Um, leaning in. I, <laughs> now I'm going to lean in and suggest uh, <clears throat> that uh, the board and commission document review uh, gets moved forward because I think we um, need to uh, address a few other things. So uh, that'll give us a little bit more time to review. Um, so I know we had a, a clarification question about tax waiver fees um, from Home Inc. And uh, Emily, why don't you just come up and uh, ask us your question? Sure. I'm Emily Seibel, the Executive Director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And um, first, I just wanted to say that Yellow Springs Home Inc. staff and board members will be attending the community conversations too to listen along with the village because we're not here to help and we'll be here what the village has to say too. Um, but anyway, I'm here, I sent 
a letter. Um, I don't want to read the whole letter because it was in the packet, but I'll summarize it. So uh, essentially, we were granted a full tap fee waiver for six units in 2016, which was the beginning of a fundraising project for our Forest Village Homes project. We've now completed the fundraising. At the time uh, of the request, we asked for a dollar amount because we had to put a dollar amount into our funding uh, request, uh, showing a local match. Uh, so it couldn't just be a in-kind tap fee waiver. It had to have a dollar amount. And anyway, now that we're at the end of fundraising and we're getting ready to build, um, the tap fees have gone up. And so the original, or, or I'll just read the relevant part of the 2016 resolution, section one, Village Council hereby asserts its belief that affordable housing is in the public interest and agrees to contribute up to six water and sewer tap fees <coughs> to the Forest Village project. Section two, village government contribution will take the form of fee forgiveness at an estimated dollar amount not to exceed, or I'm sorry, no great, of no greater than 2625 in tap fees and no greater than $100 in zoning permit fees. So since then, the fees have gone up significantly, and so we're coming back to council to request a clarification and uh, ex ex extending the original tap fee to the current fee uh, level or amount. Does that make sense? Well, I can say, I mean, I'm for us just going ahead and increasing, you know, we, we we had both the that we would forgive the fees and then how much they were correct in yeah. the original and that we just forget the fees as we said we would and we changed the, the amount that I would make a motion that we make that change. I second that. Um, <coughs> I'm hearing from Melissa so that that needs to be a resolution form. It happened in the past. What? It, it, it happened in the past. In the past that has been an, an actual resolution form. Um, so there would be a, an actual resolution written saying forgiving the tax fees. What is we're saying the amount? What's the time frame? Can we amend a resolution? Mm -hmm. I can't see how you can. You've got a different council. You've got a different voting body. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you need that before our next council meeting? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> I do. Um, we well, we need to start. Uh, we're hoping to get the shovel on the ground by April 9th to comply with funding deadlines. Well, is this not money that would be paid to the village? It, it is. So they're they need to put it in their documentation. Well, no, we just need the permit to be. We need we need to be uh, able to move forward. So I think we already have the local building permit, and we won't we won't be putting the tap fees in. So maybe we could wait. Yeah, yeah that's I don't, what, I don't yeah. see why it, that it would be a problem as long as the village of okay. Dallas Springs understands that. <coughs> A resolution okay. will be passed for sure. Okay. Cool. And I'm I'm not questioning uh, the approval of this. I'm just curious where to find this when I look at the budget. Where where this kind of money is set? It's in the, the revenues for water and sewer. Is there a specific tap fee line? There, there's a it's it's folded into it's folded into the consumer fees. Tap fees are included in that. So that's not. I mean, we do our best to um, judge how much revenue would be brought in, and this would just be a reduction in that revenue for the year. Thank you. I'm just figuring out still how to read all of the little details in the budget. Right. Thank you. My understanding is that this is an in-kind donation, and so it wasn't. So we we didn't budget for any uh, cost for tap fees, and so I'm assuming that the village didn't either in relationship with this specific project. Well, we budget a certain amount for tap fees every year okay. that we assume we're going to get and they do they take everything we think we're going to get and forgiveness for things that we assume we're going to get. So does anyone need any more information to write No, I, sh I can write the resolution. It, it, just to be clear, council wants to forgive up to six tap water and sewer tap fees and $100 in. Right, at the, at the current cost and it sounds like I mean, at least council is saying that they agree to this. Yes. So, and then we will vote on it at our next meeting. So, so just to be clear, Ellie, you don't need any dollar amount for any kind of grant. So, if this is, if this simply states forgiveness of all tap fees and zoning permit fees in full, 
you're good. You don't need a dollar amount. It, I think I see where you're going, and I think she actually makes a good suggestion because then what can happen is if you need a dollar amount for documentation, you can put it in a separate letter saying this goes with resolution. That's that's what I was going to say. Is I I don't think that. We will need it because we already got the point, and then we, we typically have to have a follow-up letter anyway, mm -hmm. saying to the amount, uh, so I think it's fine if, it's, if there's no amount indicated. Okay. Thanks, okay. Emily. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so I had Alan Hoover. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so at the last, at our last meeting, there was a letter from Alan Hoover regarding some sidewalk issues. and. I have a general question. My my understanding, so I'm asking for confirmation, is that if citizens find a, a sidewalk or actually a road where they are is a safety issue, who do they report it to and how does it get handled? Well, I mean, they could report it to any number of people. They could report it to Johnny directly. They could report it to my office. They could report it to Judy, and she would send it on to us. Denise? Um, Denise, they could report it to the police department, or the police department could report it themselves to us. And then um, then it would be followed up on by Johnny. And, I'm sorry. In, in that particular <coughs> situation, and I actually went down that sidewalk. There are a number of places from that house on down to Corey that are problematic on the sidewalk. And then I was riding my bike yesterday, and on the right-hand side, right when you turn from East Limestone heading uh, south on Corey, there's this big hole. Mm -hmm. Yes, today when there was water, and I thought, if I had been on my bike and I had turned through that water, I probably would have gone down. Because when there's water there, you don't know that there's a hole. So that area is really problematic, I think. But, so is is that is her concern? Is that being addressed, or as far as the repairs themselves? Yeah, I mean, is, it, is that in line to be addressed? It's it, the repairs that we make. What we generally do is issue a an RFP for sidewalk repair, and it details specific areas. I don't know that Johnny's gotten his RFP together yet this year, um, but it says, you know, we, we, he will go out and mark certain areas, uh -huh. and those areas, when we put the RFP out, there'll be a walk around where all of the bidders walk around and look at the different areas. Maybe, it seems like it would be good for citizens first to know that if you see a sidewalk or road issue that's an issue, to call the village, and secondly, then how it's handled. Because it's not going to be handled for a while, probably, and then people might think, oh, we're not doing it. And, and I think also, it, and I realize we have a lot of topics that we have on our plate right now, but at some point we are going to have to revisit sidewalks because they are a huge problem and there is no consistent funding. I mean, we put some money into them every year, but that fixes just the very worst mm -hmm. spots. So. And then as far as the overhanging yes. branches, because I know part of it yeah. was overhanging yeah. branches, um, those are addressed through Denise's office, as you as she mentioned and tonight. She had several violations. Okay, there. and that's being listed mm -hmm. as one. I was going to say, when there's something really dangerous, like <laughs> this hole mm -hmm. you're talking about, because there, there was an instance where, yeah, I saw this, I mean, it's like any bike that had hit that, it was like a great, I mean, it would have been really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe when I notified the village, they went out pretty immediately, not not for a permanent fix, but just to try to, I mean, if, if nothing else, putting yellow tape around it to say this is not safe. So, so you guys do that when you're Yeah, notified. as soon as Johnny gets the notice, he can keep it. So you noted the hole. <laughs> I heard that. Okay. Right okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, so if citizens know that, because, yeah, if you see something that you think that's dangerous, we don't want to people to think they have to wait now till the spring comes. No, definitely let us yeah. know, especially if, if you think it's a danger. Yeah. And in the past, we've also talked about that our, uh, you know, our meter readers were going to be you know, reporting. reporting these things back, as well as when our, you know, Parks and Streets crew are out. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, Again, we're trying to get the new mindset of being more proactive and, uh -huh. and taking care of things. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so I believe that's all old business. And so as we move into new business, we've got a brief infrastructure report from Johnny Burns. <coughs> I told her to keep in it. The last meeting was four hours. <laughs> so, um, just to give you a little update, uh, electric and water, when I started here, was it was pretty bad. Still is, but we're working on getting it fixed up. But what I've been challenged with since November is to see what else we have out there and where we need to address problems. Um, so I've asked each one of the uh, Brad that does the wastewater treatment facility and the drill station and the water treatment plant to give me some ideas and suggestions. Uh, a couple of the street department guys, and along with uh, one of my guys from the water department. Um, I'll tell you three things we got going for us. We got a very motivated crew in 2018. We have a brand new water facility in 2018, and we have a remodeled uh, wastewater collection place uh, in 2012. Now let's talk about what we need to do to fix it. Uh, it didn't get this way overnight. Uh, as you stated earlier, um, and we're not going to fix it overnight, but we have to do what we can to change the mindset of being proactive and not reactive. Uh, we have used nine tons of coal patch this year uh, by just going to get the coal patch and driving around the street department and trying to find potholes and, and digging streets and mess. Limestone Street, I've got it as one of the projects to try to re-black top this year from uh, Zing Avenue all the way to court. Uh, because when we did an infrastructure project there, they just patched it. It wasn't the best patch job, and now you, you'll rather your teeth out going down that road. So we're trying to head that way, but it takes time, it takes money, it takes manpower. Um, but we have the motivated manpower to do it. Uh, we just need to set a guide, see how we're going to go forward. That's the reason why we uh, talked with Patty Bates and we've met with the HR, we've met with Brian and Mary Ann and seeing how we're going to move forward. Uh, unidirectional flushing is the probably the number one priority. We're being mandated by the EPA. Uh, we actually got the machine in on last Tuesday. We sampled or we tried it on Tuesday. We got the uh, fire flow information for the fire department. Uh, they got good numbers. They're going to probably be able to save money by not having to include a pump on the building, and that's what they was they were going for. Uh, the program, however, is going to take manpower, and it's going to take a lot of valve turning that's not been done in 30 years. Um, the, I can only tell you the 16-inch water valve that we did for the water treatment plant took me and the no lineman eight hours standing there on the machine until we got it fully closed, running it down, running it up, running it down, running it up. The new machine will take a lot of the labor out, but it's still going to take time. The problem we're going to have is that some of them are going to break. That means we're going to have to dig it up. That means we're going to have to figure out what other valve we can shut down. And it's a process that we're going to have to be proactive on. Uh, High Rural Water is working with us. They're, they've actually created the program. They're actually going to be here on site when we do it. That way they can be a, a little bit of a liaison to the EPA saying, no, we're doing this, and we're doing that. So that's the big thing for the water. The next thing would be is we're working on trying to get these electric or the remote water meters, and we've been working on pricing and, and stuff like that. That will actually help if somebody's told it runs all night long, where we can identify that it is set an alarm off on the girls' computers downstairs. We can say, hey, last night you're told, or something was running at 2 o'clock in the morning, you used 15,000, 20,000 gallons of water. It will help out from that. So. Um, so then we'll move to the streets. The streets, for the most part, most part the black tops is down, and we got to actually hire that out. But we got a lot of bad curbs in town. Zany Avenue, brand new blacktop, but if you go down Zany Avenue and look, we're missing curves. That's what brought all the water down to all the storm drains that we have downtown. Uh, and 
Zing Avenue is going to be a, a job in itself where we have a lot of different curbs. Grand Center parking lot is another prime example of that. Um, streets need some equipment, but we're going to have to budget for that. We can't create an emergency just because we need a piece of equipment, so we have to budget for that. Um, let me, while we're budgeting for that, the pottery door. It was two inches off the ground every time it rained water went into the facilities because the threshold brought it away and it was just thrown away it wasn't fixed the reason why we elected to do that door now is is they had to change a hand but we was going to have to change the lock to change the lock in that door is almost 500 dollars because it's a special key so what we did is we got two quotes we chose the door put in a glass on it but a combination lot, they can have up to 300 combinations. So when they run out of space, if somebody doesn't pay it, they can delete that. They don't have to change locks, keys, nothing. So they actually got a threshold now. The door is solid. They don't get water in the house or in on the drywall. It creates damage to the drywall. So that's the reason why we changed that door. It didn't happen overnight. That door's probably been bad for, well, I know it's been bad since I've been here. Uh, being proactive towards the buildings, if you walk around the back side of the pottery barn, you will see that instead of replacing or fixing the separation in the block, that you spray from to fill the holes. That's not a fix. That's just done wrong, and that needs to be addressed. We put a new ceiling in the pottery barn, but we didn't fix the three holes in the roof, so the ceiling tile and three areas are bad again. So I have a roofer coming out to take a look at that to see if he can patch the hole in the roof. <coughs> so we have to be, we have to use the money like it's our own pockets. And we have to be proactive, we have to be budgeting. We can't just come up here and say, hey, I need a half a million dollars because we didn't do our job over the last 10 years. Um, sewer, we need to start attacking it. We had a CMON study done. We've done a lot of studies. I mean, you had this in the energy board. I'm tired of hearing about study, 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 study. We better study it some more. But let's just get something done from the first study that we did back in 93 when they did the first CMON study. 2008 when they, no, 2012 when they did the other CMON study. And it sat on the shelf and we've not done nothing with it. EPA, they're going to make us start doing stuff with it and we're behind the eight ball. So we need to be proactive. You guys have got goals, but we need to show you where we're at so we can help you guys compete or to make your goals. You guys may think we have the best system out there, but unfortunately I've got to give you the bad news and tell you we don't. Uh, we need to start cleaning the sewers. In 2014 when I got here, I was like, oh my gosh, i got a big back truck. Okay, they use it to clean up the sewers when they get clogged, but their bodies are proactively cleaning these sewers out and, and making sure that they're clean so that we can maybe partner with Fairborn until we can get our own camera. Green County, come in and stick a camera down there. Let's see what our sewers look like on the inside after we clean them. Uh, send guys to cleaning school with these back trucks. There's no reason why it's sitting in the barn waiting for a clog to happen. Let's clean them. Let's see what they look like to see if we can start doing a sewer relining project or if we just need to say, hey, we better dig that one up. Watch one get patched on Corey Street. Um, October. And first thing they said to me is, hey, we need to change that sewer. And I said, absolutely. We're going to dig up 230 foot of it because we've got a problem and it's clay, it's breaking down, and there's no fixing it. There's no relining it. We know it's bad. So we need to fix that before we have a major factor, a major EPA violation. Um, so there's little things like that we can do, but being proactive, being able to walk around with staff and say, let's get on this, let's get on that, uh, is a big thing. And council listening to us uh, and letting us be proactive it's, it is going to be this kicker to the whole infrastructure. We didn't get here overnight, ain't going to fix it overnight, but we're going to do our best to give the village what they deserve. Thank you.
Well, the only comment I want to make, and, and this is, I mean, I did, what you said I think is so important. And there's this relationship with the work that we're trying to do with looking at utility costs is to understand the phasing of how this work will get done in 2018 and 2019 because we didn't get here overnight and it can't all be done overnight because there's just not enough hours in the day. So when we consider the reserves that we have in different budget item, budget lines, it's very going to be very important for the council to understand when expenses will be incurred over maybe the next 24 months so that we can understand you know, what are, how much money do we really have to have in those reserve accounts? We have a major problem in the electric, and that is because we only have two circuits. Mm -hmm. And we also have a major problem with our, our reclosures, which are like switches or breakers in your house out midway of the line. The last outage that I was out of town for, it actually bypassed one of the reclosures, took out the one on Union Street instead of one that was 100 feet away from it. The reclosures are 30 years old, and so my guys reset it, and then we found a broken pole, and then we had to fix it. Uh, but we also need to be able to, with the development of the CBD and other glass farms, we need to be able to come out of the back of the switch station again with a third circuit to where we can divide these, the village up to three instead of two. Mm -hmm. Therefore, and, and I've talked to Brian and Marianne about this and, and Patty, that's a large undertaking that me and my staff can do. Mm -hmm. and we could do it, but then we're not there for all the problems. So that's something that I've worked with AMP, I've called Michelle uh, Palmer to see if she can come in, maybe help us figure out on the engineering side of it, and then we would have to create an RFP and go off a bid for that. But, we was proactive when we did the solar farm. We actually installed two six-inch conduits underneath the solar farm uh, to where we wouldn't have to go dig and do that again. Mm -hmm. So we do have conduits. We are. We kind of got it in our head, but we're not engineers, so we we put the conduits in. I remember the waste of money put the conduits in, and then have to dig it all up later. Mm -hmm. So we have thought about things like that. Um, the reserves and, and the capital, Melissa and I started putting stuff in capital with padding it. Mm -hmm. It's because we know that there's projects coming and it, they're not cheap projects. Mm -hmm. So the electric is a, it may be healthy, but the money can be, I mean, we have to be proactive and we have to cut down some of the outage times. And if we did that with some other equipment, then it would, it would make it a lot easier. I've actually got a company coming in to look at uh, 20 poles on Thursday that is beyond the safety of me and my guys to be able to do it. We don't have enough safety equipment nor the, there's two of us and two helpers, so we don't have the manpower to be able to do some of the poles and we're smart enough to know about it. So. I, I'd like to well acknowledge Patty and Melissa and Brian and Michelle for being Yes, but Brian and I sat down with Patty, Johnny, Tanner, and Brent Sparks and, and, and Brad for four hours. They went over the infrastructure needs, and um, I was impressed. But also, what I realized it's important for a council to be able to have that connection with staff. Mm -hmm. So I, I know sometimes council can get in and have inappropriate connections. So figuring out what's what's the effective way for council to be in our, because otherwise we're sort of here, you know, doing our stuff, mm -hmm. and you guys are doing your stuff, and they better mesh. No, so that was very productive, it, and that's why we were, as part of the being proactive, we wanted to make sure that council was maybe more fully informed as to the things that staff has to accomplish in order to achieve council goals. Because we can't do some of the things you want us to do until we are able to accomplish some of the things that we need to catch up on. Yeah. And we know that, and that's why, that's part of the reason that Johnny is here tonight, is part of the reason we have the, the, the meeting that we have, so that you can more fully understand 
where staff is coming from when we're talking about, well, you know, we'll, good. we'll get to your goal, you know. It's, it's not because we want to put you off, it's not because we don't think your goals are important, it's because we know what we have to do to get to where we need to get your goals accomplished. Well, I, I think it's not just the council's goals, but it's also the awareness of the community when when we review our budget, when no, certain numbers are there and they look big, you know, that we're all in this house together. And we have some money to spend on our house. So I think that education is really helpful to have, you know, as much awareness as we can of these issues. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Charlotte. Okay, so full repair update we've done, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay, so Barry and Bobcat <laughs> resolution. So um, I, I got this information from uh, Heather and Tina in Athens, Ohio. <coughs> I think the Ohio Bobcat is, I, I don't know that we have Bobcats in this area, but they do exist in, in Appalachian Southeast Ohio. And they had been on the endangered species, Ohio endangered species list for some period of time. They came off it, and there's now a four-year uh, study process. I think it's being done by Ohio University to study the population. Are they rebounding? What's happening? In the middle of this process, ODNR, presumably because of the influence of hunters and trappers, has made a proposal that they'll open the species up for traffic. And uh, there are a lot of people that are very concerned about that. They're concerned that they, they, we don't know what the stability of the population is. And so um, I am requesting that we join with uh, Athens, Ohio, and uh, Nelsonville, and maybe some other communities, I'm not sure of that, to pass a resolution opposing uh, ODNR's uh, proposal to open these native, the only native cat species in Ohio up for travel. And to, if we do that, then uh, to have that come to the next council and then to send it on to the people. All right, I agree with that. Yeah, thank you for bringing it to okay. our attention. All right, thanks for being Okay. Uh, I hope they don't eat beavers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, Judith, uh, finance director hiring. Yeah, I, I, I um, wanted to add this to our agenda because we've talked about diversity hiring practices, um, which I know Kevin is maybe working on. And um, as we're thinking about, I mean, I'm imagining that ultimately we're going to have a protocol around diversity hiring practices. Um, and then, you know, I've been looking more at, as we're thinking about our hiring practices, also this notion of leadership development uh, with promoting from within as a, as a really good thing to be thinking about. Um, and so um, we have this big hire coming up, and we don't have these things in place yet. <laughs> so I guess that's the reason I, I thought we should uh, I wanted to know where things stood and all of that. So, on the on specific specifically on the hire or on the diversity hiring process, or it's all about uh, finance director for now. Just the finance director, yeah, just the finance director process. I mean, I was, I mean, one of the things, for example, one of the very concrete things is that your um, interview team have a person of color on the team. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's really important. I know Kevin's been interested, you know, in thinking about the diversity of hiring practices and involving that. And you know, I was thinking, so I, I'm sort of like, so who is that going to be? What is our, what are we doing, and how are we going to, even though we don't have it in place yet, uh, make sure that we're keeping these goals in mind? <coughs> well, um, I haven't set the interview team yet for the actual process. I have a rough outline, which is. Um, the application uh, period is open through Thursday at 4 o'clock. Um, we do have, I think, seven applications uh, so far. Um, the interview process, um, I'm happy to include 
a council member and Kevin would like to serve. I'd be happy to, to have him on the interview committee. Um, as far as uh, other members of the interview committee, it would be Ruth Ann, who is my HR person, um, and probably Johnny and Chief um, as um, other department heads. Um, at the same time, there will be a kind of a, um, a meet and greet process with um, the other employees, specifically the ladies downstairs in utilities who will be supervised by this person, whomever it may be. Um, and that, I mean, is, does that answer your question as to the process? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, I just thought we should. Yeah. Um, uh, and Patty and I talked about this and then previously because she knew I had been wanted to request this to be on the agenda mm -hmm. and I said I think it's important that we have a little bit of these conversations publicly I actually think it's important the public hear that we're thinking about these issues and so that was part of the reason I felt like we should have a little public report about it and, and then uh, as far as I work in hiring practices Kevin, Brian, Ruth Ann, myself and I think Chief were you there at uh, Tony Ortiz? Maybe not Oh, you were on vacation. Um, we met with Tony Ortiz, who is the diversity liaison officer with the Ohio Attorney General's office. Um, he is supposed to send us some information on specific websites to advertise on um, to increase um, minority recruitment. I haven't gotten those from him yet. I do need to follow up on him, with him on that. Well, his, I mean, you know, his focus is on. Police, right? Which was not my expectation, by the way. But <coughs> so, but then Tony did also ask us to give him information for the finance manager posting. Did that get to him? Um, you know, I would have to ask Ruth Ann because she was going to do that, and then she went on vacation, so I I have to confirm with her on that. I know that we have we have advertised on um, it, with the Dayton Daily News. Um, the International City County Management Association, the uh, Ohio City County Management Association, the Government Finance Officers Association, um, LinkedIn, um, there's one more I can't think of, oh, well, World Springs News. Um, <laughs> but I think there's one more, and I can't think of what it was. Um, well, you know, I was asking, I was getting some quotes from ZipRecruiter, but then you said, you know, we're looking into that yourself, so zip clear. Yeah, maybe it may have been zip Okay. And what about having two council members on the hiring committee? Well, we could. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, we have so many things going on that you know relate to finance uh, in terms of goals. So, I I would advocate for that. Can I just make a suggestion about, I know that it's a policy of the village, I'm not quite sure why, but I know that not posting a salary range tends to disenfranchise women and minorities much more than it does white males. And I've always been curious as to why there's no salary range posted on any of our postings. And I think it's a really easy way to increase that visibility for folks who might otherwise just say, well, I'm probably not qualified at work. It's not worth jumping out of my safety zone to go over there for something I don't know. Well, I wondered that because I mean, we're a government function. I thought, right? And yeah. most municipalities do. Yeah. Fairborn, Dayton, like, you know, just kind of happen to like browse there. Yeah. And we're just talking the range, not a. Right. You know. right. And they do a range, I mean, it's like a $30,000 range, so mm -hmm. it's not. Right, it's pretty broad. So we have a policy that we don't. I've never seen it posted. That's oh. all. It's, we have a we have a pay we have a a pay scale pay you know classification, and while normally you would start at a certain place, um, there is a, an allowance in the personnel manual for that to be changed a little bit based on your qualifications and your experience. Um, we certainly can start posting it. Anyone that calls, we give them the information anyway, so it's not like it's a secret. Um, this one is quite a bit DOQ um, because there are different things, you know, government finance accounting, which was Melissa's suggestion that we rely heavily on, um, you know, things like that. So there is a pay range, which 
you know, if, if someone calls and asks us, we tell them what it is. It's just not in the person. So I honestly don't know the answer to your question, Judy, but it's certainly a good suggestion and we can do that. So Melissa's going to clone herself, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if there's another council member that would be interested, um, please let me know. Well, I certainly would. Thank you for the suggestion. Uh, I mean, I think our, if the president's willing, I kind of think somebody else can do that. Oh, well, but yeah. I do think that the president plays that kind of key role. Okay. And then I had one other little thing just because I. Uh, which is that the energy board, the next energy board meeting, we wondered if we could get a person from HRC and uh, uh, Environmental Commission uh, to talk with us and perhaps um, Becky Brunsman will be coming um, and uh, to talk about this whole di idea of this educational forum that would happen in the early fall. This is the idea we, the energy board is going to need help. To try to help that happen. We thought there was some overlap with what HRC is thinking about affordability. Um, and you see with climate action? Yeah, and then the Environmental Commission. Yeah. So, so, what, what are your so our next our meeting is the third uh, Tuesday. It's the 17th at 6. Yes, yes, it's the 17th at 6. So, it's that meeting that you want? Yeah, that'd be awesome. It's EC meets on that Thursday. Oh, yeah. yeah, somebody. And we're going to ask the mothers out front also. Um, <coughs> Lisa, utility rates? Uh, next meeting. Okay. You didn't want to talk about that today? Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, manager's report. Um, I just have two things real quick. The first one is congratulations to Sergeant Naomi Watson for receiving the David P. Eckert Outstanding Law Enforcement Service Award uh, for her outstanding commitment to victims of crime. And, and as uh, everyone knows, Naomi uh, is, is very, has a very strong commitment to victims of crime and victim advocacy. And she is receiving this uh, award next Monday morning, I believe, um, was nominated by the prosecutor's office to receive this award. So congratulations to Sergeant Watson. Spencer, if you could, please. <laughs> Thank you. Spencer is my partner in crime. <laughs> Melissa? I wish Aww. you success, well, thank you. happiness, and I will wish you more than you know. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, Melissa, your last ABM report. Yeah, I kept, I kept it brief, but I added on a whole bunch of stuff um, in handwriting based on some meetings. Um, there's a facility maintenance needs placeholder in there. This is just something for council to consider. I know that there's been a lot of facilities and infrastructure and, you know, financial discussions that have already occurred tonight. And um, these were some things that were related to Sutton Farm um, that haven't been incorporated into the budget and are just uh, simply placeholders that may be coming back to council at a future date um, down the road but they're just sitting there so that council can consider those and we've had some HVAC problems within the Bryan Center for quite a long time so there's um, <coughs> there's some information in there about that too just of course for council to consider um, the only other thing that I wanted to include was that we had changed, we've really tweaked the utility office hours um, a few times. When I first uh, came here, the hours were from 10 to 2, and we had no um, no telephone bill pay, we had no online bill pay. Um, you could show up to the window and you could drop your payment in one of the boxes, and that was pretty much the only way that you could pay. So since I've came on board, we now have a 24-7, 365 telephone um, payment service that folks can call. We also have um, online bill pay, um, and then we've also expanded office hours. So it went from 10 to 2 to um, 
seven thirty to three, eight. Or eight to three, and then in January we had expanded again um, from eight to five, and we were kind of staggering the the two clerks, and that's created a number of issues. If one of the clerks, if the later clerk calls off, then somebody else has to fill in for that person. It was creating overtime issues. Um, it was also um, kind of discouraging anybody from being able to take off because then somebody else would have to pick up that extra shift, um, those extra hours in that shift. So um, it's been discussed quite a bit between Patty and Johnny and myself, and what we're going to do is starting on April 9th, we will be open from 8 to 4.30. So that's only shaving off a half an hour, and then we're going to go back um, to being open until 6 p.m. on the 15th if we need that um, extra time we're able to provide that to customers so we are doing that um, so again that will be April 9th 8 to 4 30 Monday through Friday and then 8 to 6 on the 15th and then again if the 15th falls on a Saturday um, that those extended hours would be on Friday and if it falls on a Sunday those extended hours would be the following Monday and everyone's going to work those yes mm -hmm. correct so uh, there was one other. Now we just stick our payment in the slot. Oh, absolutely, right. absolutely. It, really, the window is more for people that are troubleshooting or have questions regarding their bill uh, or need to really talk to somebody, which um, leads me into my next topic that I just wanted to address uh, prior to me leaving is just utility bill troubleshooting. I know that we've had you know a number of different circumstances in which have made customers question their bills and I just want to kind of outline a number of reasons in which higher than usual bills could be attributed to I know that uh, leaks are mentioned quite a bit and I know that a lot of people think that that's a go-to answer for the utility department, but it's very real. And if you actually flip over your utility bill and look at the back of it, and it's also on the online bill, there's actually a water leak chart. And there's a reason why we put that in there. And it, what it does is it demonstrates that a tiny pinhole can really add up to a lot of water that's lost. Um, running toilets are a huge issue, and it's less than a ten dollar fix to fix a flapper and that's an incredible amount of water that could be saved so drips leaks um, things like that can really add up to an incredible amount of water so people just really need to pay attention to the to the faculties within their own homes and realize that those can correlate to higher higher uh, utility bills incorrect reads if you're a person that reads your own meter um, sometimes those numbers can be transposed sometimes they could not be legible we try to make contact with those people but those can oftentimes you know translate into uh, utility bills that could often be higher and that those are things that we're able to troubleshoot but again you just need to give us a call we're more than willing to come out and do rereads of things to make sure that things are correct um, unusual weather events. I think that something that a lot of people really lost sight of this year is in December it was unreasonably cold outside and a lot of people you know were frustrated because we had that cold weather and then that higher bill that happened at the beginning of uh, beginning of January and some people's weren't captured until the beginning of February and we were able to look back at usage and we were able to figure out that 2015 it was either 2014 or 2015 was an equally as cold winter so we've been able to marker people's consumption what it was back during that last cold snap and to say hey you really have used this much electricity before and it happened back then so if you ever have any questions um, basically all this boils down to is come to the utility office first don't go to social media or just take it to the street talking to your neighbor like hey what was your electric bill mine was this everybody's home in the village is different people have different windows different insulations uh, different um, ages of homes different habits there's um, different sizes of households I mean there's so many factors that there really is no apples to apples comparison so we just want people to be able to call and we're more than willing to work with you to try to troubleshoot or answer questions if a uh, utility bill is considered unusually high or just confusing to customers. So that's my spiel. I appreciate you sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So Melissa, a couple things I wanted to follow up on. Um, so I believe I, I heard you say that if we wanted your support with hiring the new finance director, you're open to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you are willing to help that person get up to speed? Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of transition, I believe I also heard you say something about how we might not need to bring in a CPA or something, is that right? I think if, if an aggressive timeline is followed and you're only talking about you know a few weeks gap at minimum, I think that I will have it to, I mean I've worked really hard in the last month to try to make sure any kind of loose ends were tied up. So it really should just be a matter of just approving purchase orders and things like that as they come through to keep things going. I'm hoping. I mean, I'm not saying that something couldn't come up where, you know, it might need assistance, but I'm more than willing to help as much as I can in the interim. And, and Melissa and I are meeting on Friday to go over some final plans and ideas. Awesome. I've documented everything the absolute best that I can. I've got a binder that's a two inch binder in my office that I've totally updated in a month. So wow. All right. I tried to make it easy, I hope. All right. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. Okay, Chief. Good evening. Good evening. Help me help you. <laughs> Sorry, I just watched Jerry move on. Um, the department is pleased to announce we are uh, very excited that Florence started today as our community outreach specialist um, and has uh, come in a very busy time. Our new officer, Richard Neal, um, he is currently in the FTO field training with uh, Corporal Bean. And uh, all reports are real good. He's very excited, and uh, I'm real excited he's here. Any questions? He's he's, he's a very happy young man. He definitely is. Yeah. He loves being here, and uh, always got a smile. And I really enjoy having him around. Sweet. All right, Chief Carlson's going to be serving up hot dogs this Saturday in front of Shannon's the station. Shannon's going to be with me. Nice. And, uh, come by and. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chief. Okay. All right. Chris Conard. I have nothing to add. All right. Okay. Uh, Judy Kidner. Just briefly, I wanted to give uh, Samantha and Mel and her the crew down there in the youth center some real props. There are lots and lots of families who are unable, um, for one reason or another, to take their kids somewhere awesome for spring break. And they go to the youth center, and they start at Disneyland, and that's what we got. Mm -hmm. And those folks are down there making sure those guys are fed and happy and get some treats and get some movies and get something special all week long, and, it, and they do a <coughs> fantastic job. I really, truly appreciate it, partly because my darn kids were down there a whole bunch. So <laughs> I really, truly appreciate it. And then I just want to say, Farewell to Melissa, you've been a gem of a co-worker, you just shot into this position, shook it up, made incredible changes, did an incredible amount, you haven't slowed down for one second from the minute you got here, and I'm going to miss your energy, your exceptional confidence, and your joyful approach to life. I'm going to really miss you. Thank you. And Stella, too. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, real quick on future agenda items, we've got a million things for the next meeting. Um, is there anything that's missing? I've got, I've added the resolution for the Bobcats. Yes. Uh, resolution of the glass farm that needs to come back. Um, I, I don't know that it's more waiting. Yeah, I, I don't I think wait. we want to take some time to consider okay. the things that we're doing. Yeah. Um, we'll wait it down. So you got the whole week. Got the tap key. Yeah. Um, I want this, uh, you know, uh, utilization of our social media capacity on there since I did not have time to raise it tonight. Um, oh, I guess the commissions, the board and commission. Oh, yeah. Maybe. We'll move that forward. Um, and we'll see. Some of the stuff may just have to move to May 7th. Um, we may have something for JSTF. Okay. Anything else? Okay, with that, I will entertain a motion to move into executive session for the purpose of discussion of potential discipline of a public employee. Second. 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 Second.
And there is a second one, too. And also for the discussion of hiring a Republican chair. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, second. Or did someone make you that mean? motion? Uh, did, you, did you just? Yeah. Did you just make the motion? Yeah. And, and Lisa and seconded. You're seconding? Okay. okay. Roll call? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Hemsley? <coughs> yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Okay. And this is council only. Um, Spencer, you can wrap that up.